winning the parent lottery, like I really feels it, it was such a blessing to be my dad's daughter and my mother as well. And as I get older, I realize that like more and more, you know, um, I was much younger when, you know, my, I had my parents. I was in my early 30s and early 20s with my mother, but now being 51, I continue to get like, um, it's like peeling back an onion. I continue to, uh, like the lessons that my dad instilled in me and like the values and like, I, I get it more as I get older. Like I understand like what he was coming at. You know, I mean, he always taught like hard work and giving back was really important. I mean, he obviously dedicated his life to like giving to charity. And, um, you know, I was thinking about him on my way here today because um, whenever I would meet up with him or meet with people, like I would arrive right on time and he would always say, you're late. <laughs> He'd say, if you're on time, you're late. He's like, you should be 10 minutes early especially if you're going to an interview or something important. He's like, you, you know, arriving right on time means you're scrambling for time. But, um, I don't know. I, um, you know, there's so, so much uh, I can think of. Um, like, he, you know, growing up, it was uh, in our household. I don't know if like other people experience this. I don't think they do, but there was always like um, an electric, exciting quality in the house, and like just, I think it was my dad's presence. Like I felt, you know, I mean, I I didn't know any different, but I realize now how different it was to have like athletes like walking around the house you know Terry Bradshaw came over a couple times with his dogs and like I didn't think anything of it because I was like four and five years old you know Mario Lemieux like ate dinner at our house because he did his sports show from our basement so anyone he was having on the sports show would just come over and like that's I mean how lucky is that to get to grow up with that, you know. So, you know, it was it was always very exciting and like and like electric and even though I didn't know any different, like there was a part of me that knew like that I was really lucky, you know. And um, I mean, and then there were like drawbacks, like everywhere we went, like people always like wanted to like ask my dad questions and how are the Steelers going to do this year and you know like wanting an autograph at dinner and stuff like that but um I remember his favorite story was um somebody had written into him and you know he, he did his sports show and he always like signed off uh this is this is Myron Cope on sports, he would always say that. And um, this li listener said that her little baby um, was always in his high chair and they would always have my dad's show playing and the baby had never spoken. And one day my dad had started his sign off saying, this is Myron Coase, and she said the baby said, on sports. <laughs> and so he loved that. But um, yeah, thank you so much for, for being here and honoring my dad. It really does mean a lot. I was thinking about it last night when I was driving in my car and it just uh, really touches me because I miss him terribly. So it's, you know, thank you. introduce our first panelist for print journalism. Uh, I mentioned Ed Bouchette earlier. Uh, Ed uh, works for The Athletic now for years, uh, worked for the Pittsburgh Post-Gazette, and Tom McMillan, uh, just a terrific sports journalist uh, who's now working for the Center for Sports Media and Marketing at Point Park. 
Uh, before that, uh, the Vice President for Communications for the Pittsburgh uh, Penguins, uh, also writes some books uh, in his spare time, and just a terrific print journalist. So I want to turn it over to Tom and Ed uh, to talk about Myron Co. Print Journalism. Okay. We're bringing this out to the top. <laughs> and Tom, Tom and I also worked at the Tribune Review together, and uh, the Post Gazette. Elizabeth, it's interesting uh, seeing you. I can see your dad in your face. No way, no, we're just saying it. So it feels, feels like he's here. Uh, first of all, thanks for, thanks for having me. I remember uh, speaking of, of Cope as a writer, uh, early in my journalism career, I was at the Post Gazette, this was in the early 80s. I just tell what I was. I was at Point Park. I graduated in 1978. Um, early 80s, I was, I heard the story about Dan Marino when he was playing at Pitt. And I was at a practice, and Cope showed up. And it's hard to explain to you how big he was in town. There's nobody now who could be that big in a sports team as Cole was back then. There was such fewer outlets. Now we have 24-hour sports talk radio. There was one hour of sports talk when I was in college, six to seven, on WTAA and Myron Cope. You wouldn't listen to sports, that's what I'm So Cope was, was already a, a, an icon uh, and Steelers color commentator. And so he walked by one day and said, you know, he was Hey, Matt, that was a good story. <laughs> and I was excited just because Myron Cope knew who I was. And he, he knew my name. And so when he left, somebody walked by and said, that was a really big compliment. Said, no, he said, Cope was a better writer than all of us here. And that was the first time I realized that Myron Cope was a print journalist. Because in, even in my life, as old as I am, I only knew him as a talk show host and a, and a, and a color commentator. So I, I, I did some research. <laughs> And I found that you know he uh, he worked went to Pitt, wrote for the Pitt News, uh, worked for the Post Gazette. Uh, with Myron was cantankerous and headstrong. He didn't think the Post Gazette handled it very well, so he went on and wrote for bigger publications. He wrote for Life Magazine, which was huge in the, in the country, and Sports Illustrated, and uh, and did some you know some really really brilliant stuff. The what I found through realizing that is even on the even though he was a character, Cope was a character. He, he would magnify his voice and, and he would he would mangle the language on purpose. That was his character. He would say, he would use the word ain't all the time. Ain't And he, he would call the Cincinnati Bengals the Cincy Bumbles and he was like, oh. he would do yeah. those things. And, and, and also he would use uh, the vernacular, the Pittsburgh E's now is Yins, Y-I-N-Z. It didn't used to be Yins. When I was a kid it was Yins. Y O U N S. And he would say, Young's, Young's that. He was, so he led you, that would have led you to believe that he wasn't well educated. It certainly wasn't a brilliant writer, but that was just his character. It was, it was kind of amazing to then to read the things that, that he wrote and some of the pieces he wrote in Sports Illustrated. And, and one before I turn over to Ed, and we can go back and forth a little later. One story I always remember the other giant of national sports media at that time was Howard Cosell. Monday Night Football, Howard Cosell. It was, was just huge. And Cosell would come to Pittsburgh, and he would always be on the Steelers pregame show. And he made a big point that Myron, you're the only when I go around, you're the only show that I do. And it's because Myron was assigned to Sports Illustrated very early in Howard's career to do a Howard Cosell a profile piece in Sports Illustrated. And reading it now in retrospect is very early in Howard's career. He thought it makes sense, but the public would have known that. I mean, Howard was. To be condescending, arrogant, and, and Cope got him exactly in character. Cope got him exactly, and Cope would always say that that Cosell's first reaction to the story was he hated it, and then after about a week he got all this great reaction from the New York media, and so Cosell would say, "Cope, great piece, great piece," and he would always then do Myron's show here. He would talk Myron for reading the little you know, the Dormont appliance, but uh, just. <laughs> So, uh, and I, I think uh, before we, I'll turn it over to Ed and then we can go back and forth, but one of the great characters, and that's true, but I think the, the, the only downside of that is the character part overshadowed the fact that he was a great journalist, and that was the foundation for his entire career. And you can see that whenever there was a story, Cope knew how to do it. Like the, today's shock job sports, they don't know what to do with, with those things. He knew it, now I understand why. And, uh, 
just a, a, a great honor to have known him and worked with him and uh, in, interacted and, and really read his stuff. Because sometimes when you're a writer, writing slump, you go back and read uh, really well-written stories. And I, I had some Coke stories in my file. So I was say it was that for inspiration. So a very important part of my life. And that Howard Cosell story uh, was selected by Sports Illustrated on their 50th anniversary. They picked up 50 of the greatest stories, and that was one that they chose. And he also won, which was a huge award, uh, the E.F. Dutton Prize for an unbelievable story he did on what was then known as Cassius Clay. Uh, you know him as Muhammad Ali. A coke did it in 63, and he followed him around on the train. And this is when Myron was uh, freelancing. And uh, I read that story when I was in college. Uh, I, was, uh, I was given a book of great stories, and that was one of them. And I always remember that story as being just outstanding. And <laughs> it was, the E.F. Dutton Prize is the, uh, goes to the best magazine sports writing story that year of the whole Every, any magazine you can think of. I mean, he wrote for what, oh, they're all expired now. In fact, the post is almost expired. Uh, <laughs> True Men's Magazine, uh, Sports Illustrated, Tommy mentioned Life, and uh, what was the other, what was another one? He, that, that, that Clay story was in uh, True Men's Magazine. Um, and, uh, you know, he just, and you could make money back there in freelancing. I remember him telling me the story. His first job was up at the Erie Times. <laughs> he said he had to get the bowling scores in and type up the bowling scores and write a little thing on them. That's how Myron Cope's literary career began up there, other than the pit news. And then he went to the Post Gazette, and like Tom said, he didn't like how they handled him. Uh, you know, and I was doing research once. He went. So he went into freelance writing and got all these awards and then wrote books and you know the ultimate book is Yoy and Double Yoy I have back home. That was his autobiography. And I think he said, Elizabeth, you, did you set him up with a computer to write that? Um, or did you help him with that's the first time he ever wrote anything on a computer? He wrote longhand. Right. And then, um, right. our neighbors wife like typed it all up. He started using it, and he said, I can't do it. Yeah, yeah. they tried to teach him for like a whole day. Right, right. And then he returned. Bought this new computer and everything, right? Yeah, he could. <laughs> and Tommy, and I can tell you, it's a lot easier writing on computers than it was on typewriters back in the day, but he said he did it longhand, which is... He even had a manual typewriter. Yeah. It's now the But he, so he went to the Post Gazette and um, he, uh, he didn't like how they handled him or used him. And, you know, even in the 60 World Series, he went back, he had left, but they asked him to write some columns or something on the series. And I was doing research on that series once and they were shoving him in the back. I mean, he wasn't in the front page, it was Byron Cope. Um, so he, he got a little frustrated there and then, um, he started doing some radio, and the reason he did radio was, uh, I guess he started making more money, but it was all came down to health insurance, I think, for Danny, right? Mm -hmm. He had a son, Danny, who had special needs, and he needed health insurance, so that's, that's kind of practical ways, you know, people left journalism back then, now they're just being tossed overboard. Um, but I, I did have some things here that I, I wanted a, a couple stories. Cope, Love Gene Collier's writing, and Gene is still working at the Post Gazette. And if you get if, if you haven't ever read him, you, you need to start reading him. Uh, Cope thought he was one of the great literary sports writers of our time, and I would tend to agree with him. And he wrote Myron's obituary, and if you get a chance, you go back and read that. I printed it out, and uh, I know I read it when it came out, but what a piece of work! And Myron was always worried that. Uh, his writing career would be glossed over when he died. He said, all they're going to remember me for is the inventor of the terrible towel. He said, that's going to be in the headline. Myron Cope, inventor of the terrible towel, dies. Well, Gene did such a great piece, and he led off with his uh, ability to write. 
And um, just to show you how good he was, Joe Gordon was a PR man for the Steelers long time, back into the 60s, uh, famously in the 70s. He was their PR man. He's still pretty good shape, Joe is, and he was probably Cope's either best friend or one of them. And he talked about how Myron was such a perfectionist. And um, he'd say Myron was still doing some stuff. He did something for um, uh, Pittsburgh Magazine, I think, uh, uh, of the city paper, which is free, and Cope wrote something for that. And here's, a, here's a quote from Joe Gordon. He was such a perfectionist. I'd say to him, Myron, all you're doing is changing one sentence, and it's taking four days. And that, that was Cope. That was him as a writer. And I, I, I think when he wrote those pieces later for Pittsburgh Magazine, the city paper, the public was astounded. They didn't know that Cope could write because he was such a big personality on the air. And, and uh, you know, you, you knew him as the guy, as the character who, when the Steelers were during the playoffs, he would rewrite the Christmas Carol deck the halls every year. The first one was the iconic deck the, uh, deck the Broncos, they're just Yonkos. This was, this was Cook's person. So people were kind of stunned that he was this incredible literary genius, really. And I heard Myron Myron say before, he always thought that people would, 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 would gloss over his writing career. It was very important to him. And it was, it, as, as, as much of a character as he was in the air, it was the foundation for all of his success. He always could have gone back. And, and uh, and, and he would occasionally critique, you know, the local writers. Oh, he, we, 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 both yeah. were, we, we both felt his jab. I didn't use that word! Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have four or five days, Myron. I, had, I was on the deadline. <laughs> <laughs> I remember him telling me this, Tom. Uh, you know how you just, when you're quoting somebody, you start out with a quote, and blah, 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 Tom McMillan said. And he would say to me, why don't you start out with Tom McMillan said, comma, and then the quote, because he wanted, he felt it was more important to know who was saying it for the reader than it was to see the quote and then find it out who said it. And it was a good point, and I, I don't do it all the time, but I do that on occasion now. I have done it ever since he told me. But it didn't seem to be appropriate. Nobody else was doing it. I, I didn't know that much. That's why you did that. I read that. Why is that the only person who writes that? <laughs> But another lesson I think for the students in the audience, those some high school and college students, is, is Cope's example, and uh, no one, will, it's unlikely anyone will reach his status, but uh, look at how he bounced around in his career. You know, you're 17, 18, 19, 21, 22, you think you know what you want to do? You don't know what you want to do. Or you, you, you don't know what you're going to end up doing. Here's a guy who started as a journalist. He wanted to write for a newspaper. He wanted to write so much, he took bowling scores. And he ends up being one of the great broadcasters in American sports journalism, one of the pioneers of sports talk radio. Uh, and he still could have that. So your, your career, like Cope's, like ours, will, will take many turns. So think of that when you think of him as well. For those, for everybody who's kind of surprised that he was a great writer, you may only have known him uh, you know, in, as, a, as a broadcaster. Look what he did with his skills. And uh, all of us have the ability to do that. So think of that as you go through your career. And, even even Myron was very frustrated with the way he was handled, and uh, his career certainly didn't end. It, 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 it rose much above that. So we can take some inspiration from uh, from how he fought through that and, and became such a you know, such a such an iconic figure. To the point that my friends and I went to Point Park. The conversation the next morning before class started at AM was what Coke said the night before on his one hour on the air. And he, um, the only time he left Pittsburgh, other than you know traveling. For work was with that eerie paper. I mean, the grass wasn't greener for him. I think he had other opportunities. He could have gone full time uh, some places, um, certainly in writing. And uh, he just, but he stayed here. He loved this city. And uh, he used to tell me how, uh, I don't know if you guys remember the famous dancer here. They have a statue of him down there in the middle of Pittsburgh, Gene Kelly. Coped up dance lessons from his brother. His brother was probably a better dancer than Gene, um, but Myron <laughs> told me how he used to take dance lessons. I think it, his mother made him. He loved him. Did he? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he was a good dancer. 
we didn't dance much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and notice too that we, it's not lack of respect. We, Ed and I both naturally refer to him more as Cope than Myron because that's when you were in, among the, the writers and the broadcasters, he was Cope. He referred to himself as Cope. Uh, well, he'd call me Bouchette. Yeah, so. yeah, he'd call you by your last Bouchette. name. Bouchette! <laughs> you saved my life! That's why I told him he was, uh, he was having trouble, he was cutting himself shaving. I said, try that edge stuff. And he, he tried it and he was having trouble getting his voicemail. He had one of those old machines back home. And I told him about AT&T, how they, you just dial the number in and they do it for you. Bouchette, you saved my life. <laughs> But Elizabeth was talking, and we're getting off the writing part, I guess, but Elizabeth was talking how, um, you know, she learned so much from him and being late and early and all that other stuff and on time. He used to stay, he stayed in the, in the dorms, Bonaventure Hall at uh, St. Vincent during training camp, and we always stayed down the hall from each other. But one year, they put him on a different floor. He was on with the ball boys. And, he, you know, they have the old dorms, uh, had the you know the community bathroom and he'd go in and the urinals weren't flush. So these kids are they're going in there and they're not flushing the urinals. So one morning he hollers, "All boys, front and center!" And they all come out of the dorm or the doors and they line up for him there. These ball boys are you know 12, 13, 14, 15 years old. And he says he goes up and down the line and he says. If you want to be men, you have to learn to flush the urinals. <laughs> okay, go back. <laughs> but he was uh, he was a, he was fun to be around. I uh, enjoyed every minute of it. We spent a lot of time at the training camp together. I'd go down to his room for a toddy, and we'd sit there and BS uh, a lot of it uh, on writing too. Um, he would critique some stuff, and I thoroughly enjoyed that. I was a sponge. Yeah, and go, and this, this stories are available online, so go look at those Sports Illustrated stories. Go look at that, and, and the story truly that he wrote on Clay. You can, you can find them. And the Sports Illustrated story he wrote on Pro Cell, and that'd give you, you know, a, a sense of how, of how talented he was. And he was a, he was kind of beacon for all of us, and Andrew Stocky here, I know, you know, we all, we all had a chance to interact, and, and, uh, and, and work with him. So just appreciate uh, Bernie inviting us here. It's, it's kind of interesting. And uh, when we talked to each other, I said, nobody's, nobody's ever asked us to talk like Cope is a writer. It's kind of interesting to go back and remember and read some of his clips. And, and uh, you know, he's, he's gone but not forgotten. But I, I think I'd forgotten a little bit about the brilliance of his writing. So it was, a, it was interesting to go back and read some. The other thing about Myron, too, is like, he certainly wasn't a tall man. But he was one of those guys who would walk in the room and immediately command the room. And I don't know how you describe, Mary would use like that too, but he's 6'5". I don't know how you describe, we don't know those people, we're all in here, nobody here is commanding the room. If he walked in, he would. He has that kind of, he had that kind of charisma and gravitas um, that, that, uh, that made you kind of want to follow. And uh, this quote in uh, Gene Collier's story, when he left the Post Gazette, uh, to, to freelance on his own. One editor said to him, he said, kid, you'll starve. You'll be back in six months. <laughs> Never happened. <laughs> Why don't we open it up for questions? I do have a Myron Cope story that I forgot to tell up front. So I moved back to Johnstown around 92, 93. And Jim Mooney, Mr. Mooney, the editor I told you about, Go through the market. Sorry. <laughs> I'm a print journalist, so this is my first nature here. So, 1992, I decided to leave D.C., go back to uh, Johnstown, Pennsylvania, and I was starting a PR job, and I was starting my own magazine. And Jim Mooney, my first editor, who was friends with Myron in Pittsburgh, said, would you do me one favor when you get to Johnstown? He goes, call up Myron Cole for me. He goes, you and Myron get to, you just have to get to talk to him, get to know him. So I called WTA and I left a voicemail. I said, Myron, I'm calling. Uh, 
James H. Moody told me to uh, leave a message, and he called me back, and the first thing he said was, oh my gosh, I thought Jim died. Is that's why I thought you were calling. And then we talked for half an hour about sports and sports journalism and sports writing and how he felt it was changing in a way that he didn't like a whole lot. So I'd like to open it up for questions uh, for the panel, for Elizabeth here. So what questions do you have about Myra Cope, the print journalist? How did your dad feel about the um, well, he used to always say um, there was no such thing as a celebrity. He always said, um, you know, they put their pants on one leg at a time, just like everyone else. Like, um, you know, he, uh, he didn't like, like, he didn't even like watching, like, the Academy Awards on TV or the Golden Globes. He'd say, oh, they just think they're all something. So, um, he liked regular people. I can tell you the thing about his celebrity. Uh, we used to go to this place after hour, uh, not after hours, after practices, um, to have a couple of toddies, and that place closed down. So we were looking for another place around Lake Trove, and we found this place deep in the darkest area outside Lake Trove, out in the country. And we go down there. It was the first time we were ever there. We get down in this. Cope called it the Rathskeller. It was a basement. And um, Gene Collier was with us and a bunch of other guys. And we go in there, and all of a sudden, you see the head snaps from the people. It was a crowd. They see Cope, and their heads are snapping. Next thing you know, he's sitting down in a chair, and there's a line of people waiting for him to get his autograph. One guy come up to him, and he says, Myron Cope, I got your autograph five years ago. Ha, Cope does. He says, well, if you'd have died, it'd be worth something. <laughs> and Cope goes, well, I'm sorry, I couldn't, can't accommodate you. <laughs> but that, he, everywhere we went, people were just, no, nah, it's in there. <laughs> it fell apart. I have a photo from Cope. My son got an autograph from him and told him his name. He was at the car show. My son went to Pitt and uh, he goes up to him, what's your name? He says, Scott Bouchette. He says, your dad Ed. He says, yeah. So Cope signs it. Your dad idolizes me. <laughs> <laughs> I still have <laughs> Other questions? I know I he idolized, yeah, I know that he idolized Mr. Cope, but did Mr. Cope idolize anybody? No. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't. He honestly didn't. Like, in fact, like, he didn't even know who a lot of celebrities were. Um, like, I remember a lot of people that he knew were like, oh, I don't know who Leonardo DiCaprio was. He's like, who's that? You know, I mean, no, he didn't really trying to think if he had, you know what, he did really idolize Frank Sinatra. I was going to say Sinatra. Until he read his, his biography, or his autobiography, he said then he, he felt cheated. <laughs> he loved Sinatra. Yeah, he did, he liked We were in Sinatra. Minnesota for the Super Bowl, and Harry Connick Jr. was singing at this place. And Cope said, I gotta go see him because they say he sounds like Sinatra. Sinatra was dead. So he went there and he came back. He said, Didn't sound like Sinatra? <laughs> he was disappointed. <laughs> so many questions, so little time. Did you ever get annoyed? You mentioned at dinner time people were always coming up. I, and I know that's kind of an invasion. Have you ever been annoyed by that? Yeah, sometimes. Once in a while. It just would depend on his mood. Yeah, sometimes. Well, but I mean, he was never rude to anybody. Like, the most he would say is, like, you know, I'm trying to enjoy dinner with my family. Like, can you please, like, you know, allow me to do that? But, like, 
you know, once in a while. Yeah. He, I never saw him turn anybody down. He never turned, he didn't turn anyone down. And like, if sometimes he'd say, Let, you know, can I'll do, I'll sign something after dinner. But um, most of the time he was okay with it. He felt like it was part of, of the territory and he never understood why athletes um, got, when they would get offended at someone wanting their autograph. He had trouble. Everybody wanted to sign the terrible column. Those are tough to sign. Yeah, he would always ask me to hold it. Talk. Yeah, yeah, and you had, to have, you had to have the Sharpie <laughs> or forget about it. Couldn't do it with a pen. If we close on this, too, just an idea with people, the, the great iconic idea is any game you turn on now today, people are waving towels or pile or something. Or being it's, it's all from what, from what Coke did. But the original terrible towel was not the one that Colt had. It was nicely printed by Aaron Coaster. The first one, whatever, was something in the 70s. Cope on his talk show said, we need to get some energy for the Steelers, so bring a towel from home, a black, gold, or white towel. And so the original terrible towel game, people had bath towels, they had handkerchiefs. <laughs> like people, I don't yeah. know if there's video, but that's the way, it wasn't like this. I think when, uh, uh, Swan and Stallworth. Remember when they were yeah. Toronto? Yeah. I don't think those were terrible no, that, 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 that came later. It, it was it was bring it from home. That's what made it organic and iconic. People were bringing these towels, and, and then it became it became so popular. And for a while, Kobe said the Steelers would never lose if you waved a terrible towel. Okay, that, that went away. <laughs> you know, Tom. Uh, he talks about uh, what was that famous um, uh, GM's name at WTA. 1250 doctor, I forget it. Anyway, they had a nickname for him. And he told Cope to come up with a gimmick for the Steelers. And Cope told the story many times. And gimmick? Well, I'm not a gimmick guy. I'm not a gimmick guy. He says, I'm not a gimmick guy. Cope, I'm not a gimmick guy. That's what he says. I'm not a gimmick guy. And the guy says, uh, your contract is up in, in three months. He says, okay, I'm a gimmick guy. <laughs> But it does seem like he gravitated to sports, like even in the off season. I like had a, uh, I was listening to Myron years ago, and your phone was talking about journalism. journalism. One night he says, they even had me in Russia. They called me man ho ho And uh, I was going to kick out of that. <laughs> So it was today and it was Twitter, they were caved in and he'd been off the air in two days. So just remember that. He, was, he first started doing commentaries, right? That's how he broke yeah. in. And then that, the Steelers, 
that was like 68, and the Steelers in 1970 asked them to be part of their broadcast team. Um, and then that, that everything took off. I mean, what a perfect time for him to, to get in. But he, he, really, right? he, he probably was the first multimedia journalist. Now everybody, you know, <laughs> broadcasters are running, ends on the air, you know, everybody, that, that's common now, you do it. Uh, that didn't happen back then. You were on TV, you were on radio, you wrote for a newspaper, you wrote for a magazine. That's what you did for 45 years and you got your gold watch. You know, he was the first one to kind of make the transition. And, and, and lead the way. I think just because of his talent, and probably the, the objections early on were because of his voice. You know, it, it, Coke would enhance his voice on the air. And people were, ah, I can't listen to that. And then, that, you know, he became, he became iconic because of his voice. And it would be funny when, like my parents, I, I didn't grow up in Pittsburgh, they would come visit and they'd hear him and they'd go, who is that? And you got that reaction from anybody out of town first hearing him. Yeah. What's he doing on the air? So for young people nowadays, uh, it can be tempting, uh, you know, the first, the easiest way to get attention, uh, be on camera, social media, stuff like that. Um, you know, we see a lot of people that are kind of taking off with that, but could you uh, speak to the importance of, uh, as you mentioned, learning how to write, learning how to be a reporter, develop those relationships, um, and kind of from back then until now. I don't think that Cope's character would have worked long term if he didn't have that foundation. Even though it wasn't clear to most of the people listening to him that he did, because it didn't sound like he did. But the way he did his job, um, and I think you you see that, and you know, even today with a with with a, a guy like Mark Madden, who's you know the chop shop on the air, former writer for the Post Gazette, you know, there, there, it, you used to have to start that way, and you had that foundation. And so I think that's the lesson that you can you can maybe have a year or two uh, where you can be really hot and popular, but if you don't have if you, if you don't have a good foundation, um, the chances are less likely you're going to go go long term. Okay. Tom, even on the others, I mean, Cook, uh, um, Joe Starkey, yeah. Mike Pursuta, yeah. you know, um, all these we're all we're all writers. Uh, uh, Colin Dunlop was a post yeah. writer. writer. Um, a lot of these uh, talk show hosts uh, started out as uh, sports writers. So their foundation of gathering the news, even if you don't hear that on the air, that, that it's, it's because they have that background. And he was one of the first after Coke at the KDK show on Saturdays, right? That sports show. There weren't very many others. It was Coke and it was Bean or anybody else. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true. You, you learned you learn that you that you could you could do that. You, transition and he was you know he was the no one will ever do it like him no one will ever have that status again I don't think anyone could now because of the you know, the, 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 the variety of choices they have but one thing I'll say because Alby Oxwriter just walked in I looked at hey Alby listen to this <laughs> Alby posted a photo on his Twitter the other day uh, and it was it was on what would have been Cope's 90 something birthday the, was it a picture of the crowd? Yeah, it was on Cope, what would have been Cope's birthday. And yeah, it was from yeah, 1989. Yeah. And in that photo were Albie, Stan Saverin, Bill Hillbrogue, and Guy Junker. 1989, they're all still working in Pittsburgh in prominent sports people in 2022. Yeah. Just, yeah. Just, I don't know what that says, but just think of what that... How come Steigerwald was in it? <laughs> Who was he? <laughs> Left to go to KK. KK. And, the, and the one Steelers player in the photo was Craig Wolfley. Yeah. It was a great, when yeah. you think of that, it's something about this town where if you're good, you're good, and people you know bond with you as the group. And it wasn't. I know that wasn't the reason you posted the story. In the case of me, they could have been invited better. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I posted it because of Myron's birthday. Yeah. Uh, that was a promo shoot we did. This was pre-Andrew, 89, uh, and yeah, Delta Mall, Craig Wolfley, Mike Wester, Byron, and then the four that you mentioned. It just, it just, it just, and now we just great invitations, so I hope you can do a couple. Can you do a I'll do a little bit. <laughs> no pressure on Albie, I just wanted to do, I just wanted to throw it up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Competition is later. <laughs> you know, uh, Tom McMillan, along with Mark, you mentioned Mark Madden. When Myron was on sabbatical at one point, I was filling in for Myron on his radio talk show, and, and one day they said, 
they did find somebody better. They said, we have Tom McMillan and Mark Madden, and they're going to do an audition on the air. So Mark and Tom came in, and I introduced them, and each of you did an hour, I think. And then you ended up each doing a regular we show. We exactly the same style, too. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tom and I used to do a show together on TA. Yeah, when, when, Cope, when Cope stepped back, it was just going to do a Steeler work. There was a big hole in, his, in, in the talk show. So Bill Hill drove it. Uh, Before really cell phones, we got no phone calls. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody have one final question for Tom Murray? Let's go up to this gentleman in the back. Kind of a tough question. If Myron Cope were alive today in 2022, given the current state of journalism, um, what advice do you think you would have for, for a young person? I brought with me several high school students here who are very talented writers, show a lot of promise. And the thing about pursuing you know, journalism as a possible career, what advice do you think you would have for a young person today who uh, is thinking about going into journalism? When I used to go back and talk to journalism classes, I'd always uh, I'd ask for hands to show me who's writing in this uh, in this class for the student newspaper. And it was, I'd get maybe one hand raised. You have to go out and get experience. And if you're in college, it's writing for the student paper, it's writing for whoever you can. You can go volunteer to cover a, I don't know, a junior high basketball game somewhere, just so you can get experience. And while you're getting experience, start building up clips in it. Once you do, because when you start out writing, I know when I start out writing, I don't want to see any of that stuff I wrote. But the more you do, the better you get it. And I would say, write. It's, you know, everybody wants to be on the air now, and you may end up being there, but writing is such a foundation of everything. And I know when I, when I haven't done it for a while, but I've taught some classes at Point Park. You get 20 students, and there'll be writing classes, you know, journalism classes, and you can, there are three or four students who you're who, only about three or four who can really write. And I would always pull them aside and say, you have a gift. There aren't many people who can do this anymore. A lot of that is because social media language, everything's all abbreviated, everything's just a few characters, people aren't used to it. But there's always going to be a need for it. And, and even if you don't end up writing, it'll be a fine, you know, Myron's the example. That's the foundation for everything that he did. Had he not been a successful writer, none of the other things would have happened. And I think that's still, that's still what they, even the talk show hosts in Pittsburgh, most of the successful talk show hosts in Pittsburgh, sports, began as, as, as sports writers. So writing is still so important, even though it's not the, the cool thing. Tom McMillan and Ed Michelle, let's give them a round of applause. Thank you. Oh, no, my name is Uncle Levise, everybody. I'm a senior here at uh, Point Park University, and we are going to move into phase number two of our day, moving into Myron Cope as a broadcaster. And then we have two gentlemen right here that have been in the Pittsburgh sports media for many, many years. We have Andrew Stocky, who used to work with Myron at WTAE, and Alvy Oxenrider from WBXI. Gentlemen, would you guys like to step up to the panel? Between Tom and Ed, uh, we had some great stories. It's great to see you as well, Elizabeth. We, uh, we loved working with your dad, and uh, it, it was a different time in many ways. Uh, he, he was a good connection to the to the old uh, the old way of doing things. Hi, Dad. Nice to see you. Hi, Bob. Um, this is including your including Alvin Well, you know what I, I I always talk about the day that Andrew showed up at Channel Four, and, and uh, we got and, and it's interesting how different eras merge into others. When I showed up at Channel Four, uh, Myron was there along with Bill Hillgrove and, and Stan Saverick and Guy Junker, and then. Uh, Andrew came in a couple years later, and I used to love, you know, when I grew up in Pittsburgh, uh, Bill Hillgrove and, of course, Myron were, th that's who I watched and listened to. And when I got to work at Channel 4, I, I think I spent the first two years 
uh, looking at Myron and thinking, that's Myron Coe. You know, that's Myron Coe. Uh, Myron was larger than life, and uh, but and he was great to learn from. He was great to be with and get to know. He was a, just a great guy. Well, I remember I came here in 1995, and I think Myron had finished his commentaries in 94, I think it was last year. And, uh, you know, I I would listen to the games on the radio, but I'm not originally from, from the Pittsburgh area. So my first exposure to Myron was listening to him on the radio to the games, and I was like, what is that? I, and if you're not from Pittsburgh, you're like, who is this person, this voice? And so it kind of just blew me away. I didn't know who this person was. I'm like, why is he on the radio? It's really bizarre. It's all strange. As I got to know him and began to learn about his career as a broadcast journalist, what I was impressed with was obviously he was a great writer. You learned that this morning. But he was able to get television. He understood what TV is all about. Television is visual. Television is connecting with the audience. Television is about getting people's attention and entertaining them. And he was an entertainer as much as he was a journalist. Uh, I mean, from, from the videos that he did to the Copascope to his commentaries. I'll never forget the one commentary I saw that really showed what power, not only he had, but what power the media had. So he would do a night commentary. And back in Fair River State, in Fair River Stadium, and I don't think anybody really realized this or thought about it, inside the village, you walk around, and it's a you know, complete circle. The, uh, the, the, the line of the painted side was blue and gray, which it almost looked like cowboy colors. Basically, it was Dallas Cowboy colors inside the walls of River Stadium. If you walk in executive offices, or what have you. And I'll never forget watching the commentary, and Meyer was just appalled by this. He's like, what is going on? So he takes the camera in there. He's not just sitting at the desk of his commentary. He goes to the stadium, and he's walking around saying, can you believe this? These Cowboy colors all over the place. In his voice, of course. But he basically showed you, here's what's going on inside the stadium. This is sacrilege. The Dallas Cowboys, their colors, at the Steelers' home stadium, and wouldn't you know it, they changed the colors. <laughs> but that showed the power of the media, and also the power that Myron had. And that's something that, to this day, always amazes me. And it shows me, and it'll show you what you can do as a journalist, the power you have to create change, to make things happen. He understood that. And he was able to do that not just as a print writer, but as a broadcast journalist as well. Yeah, Myron's impact was so profound. Uh, he, he was able to speak to the masses and with the terrible towel, he of course connected with this this Steelers nation. And uh, to this day, it, it's it's something that's associated with the Steelers. Maybe more of a symbol to one team than any symbol in, in any sport. Uh, and and it was because of Myron. But Myron, uh, because of his dedication to the Allegheny Valley School, he was able to uh, take this great this great gimmick, if you will, that became. Uh, part of the fabric of Pittsburgh of the Steelers, and he turned it into something so good. Uh, I remember the Cope Fazio golf tournament that he had uh, at Montour Heights and maybe some other courses. And uh, it, Myron was just, Andrew was talking about how what a good journalist he was, and, and, and that's the very root of everything that's Myron, is the fact that he was a good journalist. He was a fantastic writer. His, uh, his Sports Illustrated uh, article that he did on Howard Cosell is considered one of the greatest uh, articles that's ever appeared in Sports Illustrated. Uh, he just, that was where, he was a writer, but, but Myron understood the power of broadcasting and he did what so many others to this day cannot do, they cannot grasp. Myron understood that uh, you could have fun with it and you would endear yourself to the public by having fun, you know, you, there, we, we always, you know, Myron's, the, you know, such a legend, and and you wonder nowadays where the business has gone, if someone like Myron would be overlooked. Uh, his voice is what made him great. His uh, his act is what made him great. He was so boisterous. He was, uh, but at the really it, at the at the root of it was the fact that he was a great journalist and he knew how to in, in, he knew how to do great interviews. He knew how to get great answers out of athletes. He also knew, like all the old time uh, newspaper guys from way back when, he knew how to connect with uh, athletes. He knew how to form those relationships. I, I remember when Chuck Noll retired. I'll never forget it. Myron, uh, the, the news conference was down at the Three River Stadium. And, and Myron said, 
uh, at, the, at the very end, and I'm paraphrasing, but he said, and when the emperor said goodbye, I had a little lump in my throat. And I thought of Myron, when Ben Roethlisberger retired a couple weeks ago, I thought of Myron because this was, you know, Chuck Noll was the Steelers head coach for 23 years, longer certainly than Ben is here, and, and had such a great impact on the Steelers becoming champions. But Myron let out his human side because he was, he was friendly with Chuck Noll, and, and he had this long association with Chuck Noll. And I think that anybody who watched that, that story that he did on television appreciated the fact that Myron had a lump in his throat as he said goodbye to the Steelers legend. And, uh, you know, real quickly, I, I know that I go to my kids sometimes and I say, how do you do this? What? And I give them my phone and they'll laugh. And they'll say, well, here's how you do that. And they'll download this app. I remember when we went to newsroom computers, Myron would come in on Sunday nights after the Steelers game. We did Steelers Extra, I think it was called. And Myron would come in and it would say, Albie, set up this typewriter for me. And I'd go in and I'd, you know, the keyboard was what he called the typewriter. So I would set him up on a page and I'd say, go ahead and do your thing and then come to me when it's ready. So Myron would write his commentary. And then after a few minutes or a few hours or whatever it took, Myron would come in and say, I'm all set. And I'd go in and I'd save it. So he was, he was, he, he was a link to the past, you know, but, but um, just having him around the newsroom. And, and he was always in those shows, in those Sunday night shows, he wasn't always content to, to just read a commentary or, or do what a lot of sportscasters would do. Myron was willing to get up and lock arms and pretend he was blocking. You gotta block like this, and he would. He was. He he really jumped through the TV, and he had a way of whether with his his coperscope or uh, when he would you know look into the coperscope and he he'd be able to uh, figure out the X's and O's of what was happening in the game. Or when Terry Bradshaw had the the bird on his elbow, when Terry Bradshaw's arm. Uh, was was injured and, and Myron was reassuring everybody that that it would be all right because this was a great healing bird. He just had a. <laughs> That's going to be on ESPN in a couple of weeks. Oh, it is. Yeah. <laughs> that interview. It's amazing. I mean, just the fact that that was all those years ago. That was forty plus years, or you know, forty years ago, roughly. And it you still remember he did the uh, the MC Hammer uh, rap where where. You know, and he and he did he did all these great these great uh, music videos, if you will. The MC Hammer, he did another one. I he did he did Achy Break Heart. Achy Break Heart. Can I tell a story about the MC Hammer? Yeah, please, Deb. Deb, you see me? I worked at WTA many years, and I worked with Myron, and I loved him, loved him. He called me one day and said, "Albie, I that Myron should do a music video for the Pirates to get, you know, the whole town excited. So Myron called me, it was like on the way back from some game that he was with Bubby. I got this, well, I'm not gonna try to do it this morning, but, you know, I've got this great idea, great idea. There's this song, Icky, he had no idea what the song was, but he said, Icky Bricky Heart, I wanna be in the video. And I said, okay, Myron, but that means you have to wear balloon pants no shirt, and I'll, and I'll put chains on you, because we remember um, Hammer wore all those gold chains. And you know, Myron was such a trooper, as I talked to Elizabeth about. Um, he would do anything he wanted him to do. So we, we went up, Brian Campbell, remember Brian? Yeah, he sure. was a very good director at the mm -hmm. He went out and got all the costumes and whatever, and we shot uh, Icky Breaking Heart, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, uh, you can't touch this. And it was such a such a hit that the phones were ringing off the hook. They wanted to see it again, wanted to see it again. 
So we ended up making 30 second commercial spots just to put on the, I don't think call commercials, <laughs> but 30 second spots, you know, I scaled it down to 30 seconds. It's probably like a two and a half minute um, video. So scaled it down to 30 seconds and it was running and everybody loved it. And then I knew this guy at ESPN who heard about it. So they wanted it. So then it started running on ESPN and then the Steelers wanted to run it on the Jumbotron. So it ended up on the Jumbotron. And then I think a, probably a year later, when I think they were in the, the playoffs again, and we decided to do Achy Breaky Heart. Mm -hmm. And you know, to your point, I didn't realize until you said that, he loved dancing. So it was like, okay, now you gotta dance to this country music, whatever, and he, he right, yeah, I put him on a bowl. That bowl, you know, we used to sit on it. Yeah. You know, like, you, okay, can you go on the bowl? Sure, you know, he would do anything Anything we asked him to do, and I just I felt so fortunate that I, you know, I was executive producer of that, that I had that opportunity to work with him because it's still some of the fun. Like if you go back, if you can ever Google it, it's too bad we don't have it here, but it's so funny that he did everything. You know, whatever. You know. Well, it's funny you mentioned I, I did bring a couple of clips that you might want to see. Okay. We're, we're talking about a lot of these things, but you may not rem remember them. Oh, there. Okay, that's that uh, promotional spot. There you are, Alan. Yeah. Is that me? <laughs> that's you. Right? Right. That's you next to the very serious Bill Dover. Uh, and uh, there's Don. What year was that? 80, 80, 88 or 89. There's Webster. Is that Delton Hall? There's Delton, Delton Hall. Okay. Like Webster. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. Everybody's still. I'll point this about I brought some of a couple of the videos, but I, I, to your point, you, you said, you know, modern love dancing. I, I didn't realize that, but now it all makes sense. Because I was, I remember the day they shot the Macarena, and I was working that weekend, and they was a big hush hush thing. All I know is these four beautiful women walked in and went to the studio, and then they, they came my like, what the heck's going on? And, and then I saw the video, and it was, it was, it was fantastic. It was absolutely fantastic. And, you know, he was somebody, you're right, who would try different things and put himself out there because once again he understood it's a visual medium. You know? and, and that was saying he's a, he was a good, he was a trooper. Myron, Myron had the magic of not taking himself too seriously. So many people in, in radio and in television and even newspapers, they think that what they're talking about is the end of the world stuff. It's not. And Myron had the the magic wisdom to know that it, it, he could have fun. I uh, I have so many funny stories about Myron, and while they're getting the video set, Andrew and I were in Ireland with the Steelers in 97, and our bus broke down on the way to Croke Park, which is the name of the, of the, of the stadium in Dublin. So our, our bus broke down, and I offered to carry Myron's suitcase because we, we brought stuff with us because we were leaving straight from the game for Pittsburgh after the game. So I carried Myron, and he never forgot that. He he saw my brother years later and said, like, he carried my luggage in Dublin. <laughs> <laughs> so I think we're going to bring that up. Thanks for yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. yeah, We have some other funny stories yes. about Dublin. <laughs> so we're going to show you, first of all, the coposcope. This is what he used to do to break down football games. The Steelers have a Monday night date with the Bengals on ABC down at Riverfront Stadium. Monday night, the front four will preview the game with a one-hour special that rolls at 8 p.m. right here on Channel 4. Right now, it's time for Dr. Cope with his coperscope. Yeah, it suits the Cincy Bungles have won but a single game. Coming into the season, they were an outfit torn by problems. Two players suspended for... <laughs> ...signed to future contracts in the U.S. Football League and their offensive coordinator fired. Little wonder they've been beaten four times in five games. But let's place the Bungles under the coperscope to see what's cooking now in Cincinnati. Well, we see, we see that Bungles fans are still hollering about the fact that in last Sunday's loss to Baltimore, QB Kenny Anderson threw nine completions to Chris Collinsworth in the first half alone, but then, for no compelling reason, ceased to throw to Collinsworth. They're screaming about that in Cincy, and that's enough to alert the Steelers to expect the Bungles to try to feature Collinsworth on Monday night. 
But let us peer again into the coprostum for something more meaty. Yoy! We see the figures three and seven, and we know what they mean. Dating back to 1972, the year the Steelers became a power, they won only three games in Cincinnati and lost seven. For whatever reasons, a visit from the hated Steelers has usually turned the Bungles into Bengals. That's important because what it may say is that the Steelers are the perfect tonic for rallying the Bungles and getting them to forget their problems. Getting the Steelers on a Monday night in Riverfront Stadium may be the answer to Cincy Coach Forrest Greg's prayers. This is Dr. Cope with the Copriscope. <laughs> He understood me and what he wanted to accomplish and how he had to go about doing it. Um, 
you know, today, is, you know, we don't have the kind of time to do that anymore. Uh, maybe the format doesn't allow us to do that anymore. It was a unique time, and he really embraced it. And uh, I, and Albie worked with him. I, he had left by the time I got there, but I got to know him afterwards. And uh, you know, he's a Wayne days of broadcasting, and uh, was always impressed at how smart this man was. That's the one thing I really want to emphasize. I mean, we know him for his catchphrases. We know him for the towel, the voice. He was a very smart man. He was. He, he was also because people still ask me what was Myron Cope like, and Myron was a very reflective. Myron was quiet and reflective, and and a bit serious mm -hmm. when he wasn't on TV or on the radio. And I think that that uh, you know that that's what I remember most about Myron because I, you know when you were sitting around the newsroom or when we were at a game and and, and he wasn't on the air. Um, you know, great conversations, and, and Myron, Andrew's right, he was, he was very intelligent, but he was also just a very, very much uh, different from what viewers and listeners knew about him. And, you know, he had such a dedication to his wife and his family, and, and, um, and he just, he, he understood, he understood the, the magic of that microphone and what he could do with it. And but he didn't just do it for himself. He did it, as I mentioned earlier, because of his uh, his dedication to the Allegheny Valley School. He he really made his stardom into something, and, and that's one of the reasons that we're here today. Because his legacy is, you know, broadcasters come and go, but but his legacy lives on, and I think that that's one of the reasons that uh, he's so special. And I think we're all better broadcasters because of him. Getting to know him, working with him, seeing what he did, uh, knowing that as uh, as we talked about in the earlier session, you can have many different careers in the media. You know, he was a guy who didn't plan on becoming a, a broadcasting legend or a, a color analyst. He did all these things, and it's a great lesson to all of us. And I, I know as a person, I got to spend some time with him in his later years, just at his house. You know, just to talk to him. Uh, you know, see the the various covers of magazines that he was on and uh, his game room and everything. And, uh, just as you said, being reflective and talking about life. And I find I'm a better person because of that. And, and he also, whether he knew it or not, he, he taught us so much just by being around Myron. I, I might have been able to teach him how the, how his type work writer worked at the <laughs> keyboard. But Myron would, I, I'd be writing and I'd say, this is just an example, but I, I do remember I used the word most. It was the most incredible game. And Myron said, Albie, use the word more there. So it was one of the more incredible games I've seen. And I always remember that. I still think about that sometimes if I'm, if I'm going to write something. I remember that Myron told me that. I remember so much stuff that he would, he would tell us just off the air or why don't we do it this way. And yeah, he was a, he was a great person to come in and be able to, to learn from and, and also just be with. Like I said, when I got there and I know that uh, I see brownies in the back of the room and I know he felt the same when, when he was able to work with some people that he grew up with, mm -hmm. and, and Andrew, you, you as well. It's just that uh, it, it's a thrill. I remember, like I said, looking at Myron for two years after I started and thinking, that's Myron Cohen. You know, right. you know mm -hmm. it, was, it was just great. And uh, I have great memories of him uh, on the radio as well. With all the, one other thing, real fast. Myron would always... He, he wasn't afraid to let you tell the funny story. He wasn't afraid to let you uh, do something that would make the broadcast better. He used to do his year in review on the radio. And this is another story that we won't get into, but I had a funny story about how I went to the Rose Bowl and I gave a toast at a wedding that I wasn't invited to on New Year's <laughs> Eve with Bob Smizing. We were getting dinner reservations. We went to this place. We went to this this hotel lobby and had a pizza and Smizek said there's a wedding across the way we should go over there and crash the wedding which we did I went in and I went up and gave a toast to the bride and groom <laughs> so Myron Myron loved the story and, and I think I told the story on every radio station in Pittsburgh but so we're on the year in review and, and Myron says we, we have it in fact this is real this is a funny way to tell the story so I go into the wedding and I go up and I say my name's Bob and I went to high school with Bob and Susan and and some of you know me, some of you don't. 
some people, some people stand. So I give this toast to Bob and Susan, and, and then Smizek tells me the bride and groom were changing up in the bridal suite. You've got to get out of here because they're going to bust you. So I quickly left. So I, I go back to the pizza in the lobby with Bob Smizek and Marino Perezenzo and Paul Alexander and a couple other guys. And this woman, we go to the bathroom, and this woman comes walking out with a centerpiece, and she said, that was a great toast. And I said, thank you very much. And she said, I have to tell you, you're the spitting image of a sportscaster in Pittsburgh. <laughs> and I said, I said, well, that's my brother, Albie. I'm Bob Oxenrider. And she said, well, I thought Albie grew up in Pittsburgh. Didn't you grow up in Pittsburgh like Albie? And I said, well, yeah. But heard of, yeah. And, 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 he, and I said, well, every, but every family has one. And, and, and Bob was out. No. I, a couple of days later, I'm going to the LAX to drop off my car. I see the same woman. She's with her son, and she says, Albie? And I said, yeah. And she said, we met your brother Bob the other night. And like, so then she says, didn't you grow up in Pittsburgh? I said, yes, I did. And she said, well, why didn't Bob grow up in Pittsburgh? <laughs> your brother. And I said, well, every family has one, and Bob was ours. He grew up with some cousins in, in California. <laughs> so I'm perpetuating this lie. So finally, I fessed up to the woman. So... Myron has me on the talk on his talk show. He says, "Tell the wedding toast story," and you know it's a long story. And yeah, trying to rush through it, I I sometimes get off the track like I just did now. So I tell the wedding toast story on the air, and Myron said, <laughs> and he says, "We have time for one more call." And he, hello, and, and, and you're on caller, and he says, Myron, I'm the husband of the woman at the airport. <laughs> and Myron says, I got to see some. <laughs> so he wasn't afraid to let you tell the funny story on his show because he knew it would be a good, it would be a better show. And I think that was a great talent as well. Well, I agree. I mean, it was a different kind of talk show. I mean, talk shows today are more confrontational. Uh, you know, the the caller will call, make a point, the host will say something, and they go back and forth. It you know sometimes gets gets even. I mean, that was not Byron's show. It was a conversation. I mean, he really actually would. He actually would would say that you need to treat the callers with respect. Myron was never a guy that would get into an argument with a caller. He would he would listen to the caller's point of view and then he would gently dismiss the call, but he wouldn't <laughs> cut the guy off or wouldn't call <laughs> names. And that's to well, answer. That's what happened to back in reception. That phone call. I mean, you right. know, he's kind of like, well, but he, he was a gentle phone call to discussion, you know, and then eventually became the back reception. But uh, once again, it was really, uh, it was just a joy to, to, to get to know him and to obviously to work with him. And uh, if, if nothing else, um, you know, he can show, he shows you how you can be kind, decent, smart, creative, intelligent, and become that person in Pittsburgh. He was the guy. He was the guy. And I, I learned that over time. You know, I was one of those people like everybody else, it's the voice. But then I learned the man, the man behind the voice, something special. I, I did a, uh, on the Immaculate, you mentioned the Immaculate Reception. I did a story one time on the anniversary of the Immaculate Reception. It might have been the 20th anniversary in 92. And I did it to the, uh, Twas the Night Before Christmas. And I went to Myron and, and he, I said, what do you think of this? And he liked it. And he, and I had Myron, I would do the poem and I had Myron and Bill Hillgrove and Paul Long and maybe somebody else deliver certain lines. And Myron's lines, I, it was something like the, uh, the, something about for once. And and then Myron's line was, and so were the Raiders, those miserable runts. <laughs> and, and he loved that line. He like delivered it. He like snarled at the camera. <laughs> but he, uh, he was just, so fun to work with. I, you know, I'm sure if, if you listen to Myron Cope, you or if you watch Myron Cope, you probably felt like you knew him, and, and, and that's I think what makes that connection so special even to this day. There will never, hey, there will never be. He's the standard. There will never be another one for for the Steelers. He was the first football announcer to be inducted into the National Radio Hall of Fame, and uh, it's that connection. I mean. It, People will say, well, every town has one. You know, Pete Franklin was Cleveland, and, and, and you'll name different towns, and they'll have them. But there's not the same connection that the Steelers fans and the Pittsburgh listeners and, and viewers have to Myron. Well, we, didn't, we, don't, we hear the word unique a lot, but he was unique. 
and he was one of a kind, and there never has been and never will be anybody like him. And I, I, I would bet any amount of money on that. I know we've been talking for a while, and you can tell we're big Iron Coat fans. Uh, do you have any questions? And um, if anybody does have a question, raise your hand, and then Andy will come around and get the light to you. Or if you want to hear more wedding stories, wedding crashing stories. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so in a field like this, obviously, being employed isn't guaranteed. And sometimes I do have these doubts in my head, like, will I actually get a job? Will I, am I just going to go to debt and not get, you know, all those jobs that the college student? How did you guys handle that? And did you ever get those thoughts with your problem? Well, you, maybe you're a better example of this, because uh, this was not my original goal in my life, but I know mean, you've always been in the sports dance. Well, I think that uh, we can use Myron as a good example. How I, I used to be told, I was told by someone long ago, and Myron would be a great example of this, that if you want to do something, write and, and listen to yourself talk, even if it's in a mirror talking to yourself. Um, Myron had this great foundation of writing, and that writing kind of, opened the doors for him to do what he ended up doing. Um, I would say if you want to do something, do those things that make it possible for it to happen, whether it's being on the college radio station or whether it's writing for the college newspaper. I know Myron wrote for the Pitt News. And um, get that base of, of uh, you know, somewhere to hone your skills, whether it's writing or, or broadcasting. Um, and I'll also remember, uh, just from a male point of view, you're going to get a lot of those. It happens. You know, I didn't get the first job I applied for. Alvin, you know, if you got the first job you applied for. So you're going to hear a lot of those. It just takes one yes. And you're at the point in your life right now where it's okay to get work though. It's okay to have setbacks. You've got time. Time is on your side. That's the most important thing. So don't ever feel like, okay, this is never going to work out for me. It just takes one yes, one station, one broadcast group, one cable group, whatever it is, once you're inside, then you can go in any direction you want to. But just don't don't get down if you're here to work no. I don't I don't want to get off track from Myron, but right. he's right. It just you can have four hundred and ninety nine rejections, but the, the five hundredth is the one that 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 you know that's the one that got you the into the business. The other thing is talent is nice, but persistence gets jobs. I think that more than anything else Hone your skills, whether it's writing or broadcasting, but if you're persistent and if you're aggressive and if you look for opportunities and make your breaks, you know, your opportunity might be in this room and you don't even know it. Your opportunity might be at lunch, the table over from you. You, you have to be able to look for those opportunities um, or, or be aware that the opportunity is there. I'm not saying that you look for them, but when, when you might meet somebody and you don't even think about it, and two years later you think, that person knew this person, and that might be able to, you know, whatever it may be. Um, but I think persistence in, in being aggressive is so important. And, and if you have a dream, you just keep pushing. You just keep pushing. I, I know Andrew's, you know, I, I went for 10 months out of college before I got a job in broadcasting and I was slowly reaching the point where I, I didn't know if I would be able to do it. In fact, that's my first glimpse of Channel 4 and this wouldn't be possible nowadays for a lot of reasons, but I ran into John Steigerwald at a, at a high school football game and I said, I'm trying to get into broadcasting, can you look at my tape? And I went in and he looked at my tape one night and he said, why don't you come in to Channel 4 and hang out and, and I would go in every night. And I got to meet Myron and Billy, and that's and then I went off to Colorado, Grand Junction, Colorado, for my first job. And then five years later, and three stations later, I was back. And that's what I mean when I got back there and I got to see Myron and Billy. It was like, wow, this is this is what I've always wanted. But it took a lot of, you know, it takes a lot of sacrifice, and that's where you have to be persistent. And you have to be aggressive. Well, I would agree. I mean, that hasn't changed. It does take time, and it's not, it's not a straight line. It's a secure it's a circle. It's a, it's a twisty road to get to where you want to go. But if you have a goal and a desire and you want to work at it, that's the most important thing, working at it. And even once you're in the business, continue to keep working. I mean, Albie and I, to this day, we put in those extra hours. We put in extra time because not only do we want to 
be where we are. We want to hold on to it and secure it and get better at what we do every single day. The other thing is look up, you know, I, I, I remember literally being on the, on the laying down on a rug listening to Myron in the Immaculate Reception in 1972. And the, the guys I mentioned, Bill Hillgrove and, and Myron Cope and Jack Fleming before Billy and, and so, other, so many others in Pittsburgh, you know, those are people I looked up to and uh, now you can look up to Andrew and Greg Brown. <laughs> and, and, but, but I think that's important. If you if you see someone that that sparks your you know what they do sparks your interest, and um, absolutely go for it. And I'll be on that note. I mean, we now we are the, the keepers of those positions. That you know it was it was Myron, it was Billy, it was Sam Nover, you right. know the, the great broadcasters before us, and now we have those positions. And you know that's a pretty heavy legacy to carry on. I mean, we're never going to be them. No, but. We know now there's a history behind us. And it actually helps us to do our job every single day because you realize there were so many people before us that got to this point. Got us to this point. Uh, so I, I, I'm very proud. And Al, you're part of that too. I mean, you, know, you and I worked together at Channel 4. You were there when I arrived. Right, and, and that's what I mean. When, when I showed up at Channel 4, Myron and Billy and those guys were there, and, and then Andrew came on board, and one era emerges into the other. And, uh, you know, it, that's, that's the way it is. But Myron, I think he's he's one of he's one of he's probably the person along with Bob Prince and certainly Mike Lang has made an impact with the Penguins as well. But uh, how lucky Pittsburgh, the city of Pittsburgh, is to the the fact that they have three announcers with the three professional sports franchises uh, that that are so impacting and and their legacies are so strong. I mean, Bob Prince was. Uh, an amazing, it, it ama has an amazing legacy and impact with the Pirates and baseball. Mike Lang, uh, younger than Myron and, and younger than, than Bob Prince, but certainly Mike Lang has that same impact with the National Hockey League and the Penguins. And then there's Myron with the Steelers. Three teams, three legendary broadcasters. That's, that's pretty amazing. I think that Myron is especially unique because uh, what he was able to do with the terrible towel and raising three million dollars plus um, for a cause that was was so dear to his heart, um, I think that 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 puts Myron on a level that uh, we're here today talking about his legacy and, and what what he meant to the city for that reason. Anyone else? I know we've been. I don't know if we have time for a couple more questions. If you have sure, any. we do. <laughs> Two more. Oh, here we go. So you both talked about um, Myron's relationship with the fans. Uh, was there anything in particular that helped him build up that relationship? Like maybe uh, the radio show every night, six to seven, he could had a direct line to the fans. Like, did that? How much did that play into that relationship building up? I think it was huge. I mean, it was, it was only about an hour of radio, and you know, these days guys are on what three, four hours. But right, I, I think because he could connect with each caller, uh, because it became appointment listening. If that makes any sense, I mean. Kind of like, you know, we watch, we, we get home at a certain time to see a certain TV show. That was my own show. I mean, you know, I remember listening to it, and, you know, it was like you, you wanted to, to hear what he had to say. You wanted to hear his thoughts on things. And I think also, as, as you mentioned before, he treated the callers with respect. And I think a lot of the callers began to realize, you know, even though Myron was this large and like person, he was one of them. He was, he was a Pittsburgher. He was a fan. And I think that's really what endeared him, I think, to the fans more than anything else. That's, that's how I felt. And, and I, I think part of it is that, that Myron came, Myron was hired to do his his radio or his commentaries in 68, I believe. Uh, was that right? And then 1970, he started with the Steelers. Myron's rise in broadcasting was, it, it was synonymous with the Steelers. The Steelers, in 1972, was the Immaculate Reception. They won their first Super Bowl two years later. Two seasons later, you know, Myron's Myron's star went right up with as the Steelers, uh, and, and I think part of that is that the town was so crazy over the Steelers after 40 years of losing. All of a sudden, they they make it to the playoffs with this immaculate reception, this the best play in the history of the NFL. Myron's associated with that, and then the Steelers win four Super Bowls in six years. And, and the terrible towel in 1975, and, and all this amazing stuff that was happening. No city 
has ever latched on to a dynasty more than this, the Pittsburgh latched on to the Steelers in the 70s. It was, it was, I mean, as a kid growing up in Pittsburgh, I can tell you the date of every one of those Super Bowls. I can tell you the score of every one of those Super Bowls. I can tell you what players were working. You know, Brian Stenger was number two back in the early 70s. And, and, and that's how it was because the Steelers all of a sudden broke this 40-year drought and the place went crazy. I mean, the, if, if people talk about the Pirates after, after they had the long losing drought and they, they got to the wild card game, that blackout game, what an emotional game that, that, that was a great night for Pittsburgh. That's how it was for the Steelers. And it continued for decades because they they kept winning. And Myron was just went right with them. You know, Myron probably was responsible in many ways for the popularity of the Steelers, as much as the Steelers were responsible for his popularity. They fed off of each other, and he was. You know, you can say right place, right time, but I don't buy that. I, I, I think to a degree that may have been true. But Myron also had the magic. You have to have the magic. So many others don't have the magic. Myron had had the magic and and still has it. Well, he even sees that opportunity. It's not right. The timing is perfect. Right. But he sees that opportunity. I mean, remember when we talk about uh, forty years of a four-year drop? They, had, they didn't want a playoff game. They had never won a playoff game until the immaculate reception game. And like I said, that could cap all the franchise. And there are very few dynasties where you can point to one moment. Where it began, you know. Obviously, the Mackey reception or the, the tough rule on the other side of things, you know. <laughs> you can point to where it began, and you know he was the perfect person for that moment and for that team and for that city. I mean, it was just the perfect time, and we may never see anything quite like that again, you know, whether it be here or somewhere else. Everything was just perfect, and he was the guy that was able to take the fans along for that ride. Yeah, and I think. Andrew alluded earlier to the fact that um, it was it was a, a special time in television. Television was kind of coming in the 70s. You know, local television news was, uh, you know, they were looking for a guy like Myron Cope. I mean, Myron Cope was, he was a star. And, and uh, I think that uh, he was able because he, I always think that our personalities are able to come out because we do sports. It's not life and death. There's so much serious stuff in the newscast. Uh, even the weather gets serious. <laughs> There's ice coming. <laughs> what are we gonna do? There's, there's snow coming. And then there's all these stories and news that, that, that sports comes and that's fun. And, and I think that's a great advantage for Andrew, for me, and, and certainly going back to Myron, he was able to have fun and nobody had more fun than him. I wanted to point out one of the things I think he had an advantage too, because I'm of that generation, and same as you guys are. Uh, not every game was televised, and I can remember listening to a lot of games. Right. And there was that built-in audience for the radio. I, in fact, I think the immaculate reception game was not yeah, televised. It was not televised right. in Pittsburgh. Right. People would drive to Ohio to get a hotel and watch the game. Right. So, uh, and he had that advantage that you don't have nowadays. Uh, but just being able to, people would listen to the game on the radio. And also, there's, there was no satellite radio. Um, in television, there was no cable back in the 70s, and and there was no DVRing. I mean, he had the, the Channel 4 audience that he had at that time, and the WTAE 1250 audience. They were, Andrew's right, that was absolute appointment radio. That was appointment radio, and... and um, he made it that way. It was also a time when you had an advantage because you had a larger audience. And you had more time. I mean, a lot of these commentaries he's done are running, what, a minute and a half, two minutes? I mean, there's more time. Today, I, I mean, I get three minutes for sports. You and I, pretty much three, two and a half, three minutes right. is what we get. There's not enough time for us to do these kind of things. So he had the time to be creative as well. And when you have time, you can produce things like that. And so it really was a different time in local television. You know, in this day and age, would Myron be able to do the same things? Probably not. Um, but he was the person at, at the time when that was possible. But, and you know, you get two and a half minutes for sports, my name takes 18 seconds. So, <laughs> so immediately, I'm, I'm not even bored. When I came to Pittsburgh, they did a, uh, 
there was a, pro, a promotion that Channel 4 did. It was What's in Albie Oxenrider. And they played, they had billboards and they had TV promos and radio promos for months before I got there. And Myron was one of, uh, Twin Chilkin, Mike Godfrey was the pit coach, and several others, Hillgrove, and, and, and they, Myron. But Myron is my favorite because the way he said it, so they would have these guys and they would say, is he a is he a former bobsledder? And they would kind of debate it, and then they would say, "What's an Albie Oxenrider?" So Myron really took it to heart. He looks at the screen and says, "What's an Albie Oxenrider?" So I just uh, <laughs> and he's, you know he called everybody dear. He'd say, "Dear Albie, can you help me with this?" That he was. Uh, and you know, you were. Someone was asking earlier, what what is it that what was this connection? Part of it was if you heard it enough, and if you saw it enough, like this is my great coat on sports. You would imitate that when you were a kid. You would. I mean, you heard it so much that it was just the brand of all brands. And and uh, you know, he'd say to callers, "By now," you know, he'd say to callers. So I used to say, Myron. What, what do you think about the stock market? You're kidding me. <laughs> By now, you know. <laughs> so, so, I just, uh, you guys get a lot of lines. I mean, you know, like when people would call, it's like, so what's on your cranium? Yes. Or what's on your noggin? Yes. yes. <laughs> How do? How do? Yes. No, he, <laughs> he was very polite to callers, though. We talked about this earlier, but Myron was not, he was so polite. The store is open. Yes, yeah. the right. store is open. It, yeah, he he uh, he had it figured out. But it, you can still you can still hear people you know reciting Myron Cope isms. Mm -hmm. Cope isms. This is part of the language of, of Pittsburgh. Did someone else? No, um, I think we were good. Ellie Oxen Ryder and Andrew Stocky. Let's get them. Thank you very much. Yeah. I'm honored to be included. All right, ladies and gents, so we are going to move on to phase number three of our event, which is what Myron is most known for as a color commentator for the Pittsburgh Steelers. So we have uh, Greg Brown, the uh, voice of the Pittsburgh Pirates. He will be speaking, and unfortunately, Bill Hillgrove was, voiced, was supposed to join us but he could not be here because he is in Blacksburg for pit basketball. But luckily we do have a interview with Bill on talking about his time with Myron, so we will go ahead and watch that. These folks were absent time to go to the Is Tara here by any chance? She was the one who set this up this morning. She had the video. Is she here? Happy to be here. 
So the, what were your first impressions of Myron when he first met him? Well, when I first met him, I was a disc jockey at WTAD Radio, and they had hired Byron to do morning sports commentaries. And so I got to know him. I operated his board uh, for Steelers games, uh, for his commentaries, uh, sometimes for his nightly talk show. So I got to, to meet him uh, in 1969, and uh, lo and behold, uh, little did I know that at some point he and I would share the booth together for not only 11 years with the Steelers, but people forget that he and I had a year with Pitt in 1983 when he subbed for Johnny Sauer, who developed a heart problem and the doctor wouldn't clear him. And so I had that, uh, that premonition, can I put it that way? I had that uh, uh, pre-learning experience that served me well when he and I shared the Steelers. Yeah, actually a lot of people yeah, do not know about that when you did pit together. Uh, how, how was that transition for him going from uh, the pros back to uh, college? It was seamless. You know, Myron, he, he got it. He got the picture. Uh, he understood it was a different brand of football. Uh, he also understood it involved more people uh, than the pros. And, uh, you know, it, it was seamless. He, he just jumped right in and, and did a terrific job. And well, first of all, he knows the game. And, and that was, that was I think, uh, his calling card. But unlike many color men and women, uh, he had those funny glasses. He sees the world funny. And that, to me, was what separates him from all the other people who ever tried uh, to do analysis. Do you, you have any favorite anecdote about Myron? There are so many uh, on the air. Gosh, uh, I'm just trying to think of one that jumps out. Uh, off the air, there were so many. Uh, I remember the time that, uh, well, uh, yeah, I, I, I do, because um, Super Bowl 43, Myron was not there. He was, he was gone. And Ben took the team down the field after Larry Fitzgerald's touchdown, every pass he threw was on a Steelers receiver's hands, and he probably should have gotten a touchdown with San Antonio on the left side of the end zone. He got it in the right side. But anyhow, uh, Steelers win. Later that summer, a priest friend of mine retired up in Climber, PA, and I went to the reception after the, the mass and everything, and. Uh, it wasn't my cup of tea, so I went to the parish house for a couple of adult beverages, and I'm sitting on the back porch, and this woman comes between the houses. She said, Bill Hillbro, exactly the person I'm looking for. Uh, I said, well, why would that be? She said, well, you know, when, when the Steelers fell behind and the Cardinals in Super Bowl 43, and, and, and we were silent. We didn't know what to do. We had the terrible towel hung over the TV set, and, and somebody said, we have to say a prayer. Who do we pray to? And nobody had an answer except my seven-year-old grandson. He said, let's pray to Myron Cope. Well, the rest is history. And come to think of it, doesn't St. Myron have a nice ring to it? But, you know, that, that little anecdote involving uh, Myron after he was gone uh, is very special to me. But uh, in the booth, he, you had to be ready for whatever he'd go. I mean, he'd go in one direction, then another. Uh, but one thing about him, he always over-prepared. He'd come in with a stack of uh, index cards about that thick and rarely go through half of them. And I said to him once, I said, Myron, all that preparation, you don't even use it. He said, Billy, you never know when you have a clunker. And when you have a clunker, we got to keep in people interested in the fourth quarter. And the only way to do it is to lay some stuff on them. And, you know, I, I miss him every day. I you know, Bill, there's no doubt in my mind that Myron was pushing Santonio to make sure he didn't go out of bounds when Ben threw him that touchdown in the corner in the end zone in Tampa. There is no doubt about that. Uh, the ghost of Coke. And uh, sometimes teams feel the wrath of it. Most recently, uh, the uh, Mike Rabel's team, the uh, Tennessee Titans, uh, they stamped on the Steeler logo, and I know the ghost of Coke was there saying, 
<laughs> and it came around and bit them. Not only did they lose to the Steelers, but they also lost in the playoffs, even though they were the higher seeded team. Uh, but you know, uh, Cook can he can get you if, if you uh, debase the towel, debase the Steeler insignia. Uh, Cook is there watching and making sure. And I also have seen this thing that's hit the internet, where it says the ghost of Cook will come haunt you if you root for the Bengals. <laughs> but you know, I, I'm going to root for the Bengals in the Super Bowl. They represent the AFC North. Okay, it's their turn to try to win. Uh, the big prize, but uh, you know, Cope, his presence, and you know, the terrible towel. He's the only person that could ever have pulled that off. Nobody in our business, I don't care big, small, uh, how much influence they had, they couldn't have done what Cope did to make that towel a living, breathing, eternal symbol of Steeler fan. What were your first impressions of this little guy, Bill, when Myron first introduced him? Well, I remember uh, the boss came to him and said, we need a gimmick to tie, you know, our station and the fans closer to the club. And Coach says, I'm not a gimmick guy. He said, your contract is up in January. He says, I'm all ears. And so they first came up with uh, the boss's idea on something. And, Coach said, that'll never work. He said, it's got to be something that people have. How about a towel? They could have a gold or a black towel, or a yellow or a black towel, and, and they could bring that to the game. And he wasn't sure it was going to work. Certainly the station wasn't sure, until Lynn Swan came out of the tunnel that fateful day in 1975, waving the terrible towel. And now, all these years later, the entire stadium uh, waves a terrible towel. And, What's noteworthy on the road, Steeler fans are seen waving this terrible towel in stadiums that really should be exclusively the home teams, but Steeler fans are everywhere. And that's probably this and Myron Cope. So, Bill, you mentioned that Myron was one of the best storytellers that you ever know. What made him that one of a kind storyteller? It was in eight, it was in born. He, he was born a storyteller and uh, became a great writer. Uh, and I've seen him uh, as his roommate on several occasions, uh, mull over just one word for 15 minutes, walking the floor. And I once said, Myron, how important is that word? He says, I'll tell you how important that word is. He said, the difference between light and lightning, they're basically the same root, but they mean oh so much of a different thing. So, you know, he, he was uh, that uh, professional about his approach to writing. And he took the same the same work ethic into the booth. And that's what made him successful. He worked and worked and worked and always made sure it was the right word, the right thing to say. And Lord knows he was invented. He didn't have words. And, uh, you know, nicknames like the Baltimore Birdies and the Cincinnati Bungles, and the Clean Brownies, you know, I mean, uh, uh, the Wash, he, he called them the, the Wash Dirty Skins. Then, then when they were supposed to win the Super Bowl one year, and they ended up 8-8, eight eight, he called them the Wash Red Faces. And uh, I guess Daniel Snyder had one of his minions come into the booth and say, cease and desist, don't call us the Red Faces anymore. Well, then Coke just laid it on thick. The rest of it. <laughs> I mean, it was brutal. And uh, that's the way he was wired. That's the way he was built. And don't you dare cross him. Well, don't tell you cross Myron Coke. So we are having a impersonation contest at the Myron Coke event. Now, you, you have done it a few times already here, but have you tried to perfect it as much as you can? Well, I. One of my favorite stories involves something personal. He and I and my brother played golf up at Conneaut Lake one day, and uh, we gather at my place to have a couple of beverages afterwards, and uh, Myron is telling stories. And I'll pick it up with his voice. So I'm in the midst of one of my best stories, and I turn around and discover that I am talking to myself. 
Both Hill Road fathers are fast asleep. <laughs> and, and, uh, and, uh, I love to imitate him. Uh, never did it to his face. Uh, he didn't appreciate it. Uh, even these contests, he wasn't so sure about them. Uh, but uh, I miss him every day, and uh, Lord knows it was a great experience just being around him and becoming a friend. Why do you think he was always a little bit, I guess, leery about those contests? Well, I think we all have egos. Some of us suppress them better than others. And, and you know, I think he didn't like to be imitated. Uh, that, to him, was not a sincere form of flattery. Uh, and, uh, but, you know, I, I think if he could step back and take a look at it, he'd be very, very uh, satisfied and grateful. But uh, at the moment, his ego just kind of got in the way. Do you have a favorite moment with Myron at Connie Out now? I know you just mentioned that one before. Are there any other memories um, at Connie Out that stand out to you? One night, it was in August, there was a harvest moon. He and I, my wife, uh, two other people are on the boat uh, having a great time. It's probably after 10 p.m. And I had a I have a great sound system on my boat, and I had it turned up pretty loud. And there is Cope conducting the Count Basie Orchestra, <laughs> silhouetted in this harvest moon on the front of my boat. But this is before cell phones, so I didn't have a camera handy to capture that moment, and it's one of my true regrets. But it was a magical moment. Just picture Cope with the sound turned all the way up, conducting the Count Basie Orchestra. It was precious. Now, I know this is a very broad question, Bill, but do you have a favorite moment with Myron in the broadcast booth? Yes, I do. Uh, having won, uh, no, wait a minute, the Super Bowl that I worked with was 2005. We lost that one. Uh, so I, I can't really use that as, as an example. It would almost have to be beating the Cleveland Browns in the playoff game uh, when they desecrated the towel. And the towel and Cope got even with the Browns. And, I, and the satisfaction that he drew from that moment was, was very, very unforgettable. Do you remember what he said when the Browns did that? Um, on the air or off? <laughs> <laughs> because off the air, he might have said something that would cross the line. But on the air, he was always very professional about that, even though he'd sometimes lose control of himself and his emotions, as only he could do. And uh, uh, yeah, I remember he, he took particular pleasure in seeing the Browns go down after desecrating the terrible towel. And finally, Bill, one more question. So what do you want the world to remember about Martin Cook? The world should remember that Myron Cope was a Pittsburgh guy. Uh, Myron knew this market. He knew the people in the market. I believe we are a unique market in that regard. Uh, we're a big little town, maybe the biggest little town in North America. Uh, he had that feeling uh, for the people of this town and uh, their blue collar ethic, uh, their approach to physicality, uh, defense is important, uh, and, and Myron just was able to grab that and, and bottle it, and, and nobody will ever, ever uh, approximate what he did uh, relating this market to the Pittsburgh Steelers. Bill, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Always a pleasure. All right, so now we are going to bring up somebody who is no stranger to Pittsburgh sports media, the longtime voice of the Pittsburgh Pirates, Mr. Greg Brown. Colton, thank you. Uh, thanks very much. I really enjoyed uh, hearing Andrew and Albie and Bill. Uh, I was a big, big fan of Myron's. And you might be wondering what a baseball broadcaster is doing here. Well, 
Uh, Myron and I were in a similar fraternity that I don't know exists anymore. He was, as you know, not a former football player. Uh, and in this day and age, there are, very, there are a couple of baseball announcers, the baseball teams, I should say, on the radio that have two play-by-play -play guys. That, 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 uh, Denver comes to mind as, as one, maybe, maybe one or two others. But it was uh, rare that uh, when, when Myron did games, again, he was not a former player. So you'll notice when people talk about Myron, I think, they, they call him a color commentator, not an analyst. Myron added color to the broadcast, and he knew it. That was his game. He was not, if, if, if you Steeler fans know, if you listen to um, the late Tunch Il Ilkin, uh, and, and now uh, Craig Wolfley, they will break down plays uh, almost after each play. Now, they'll go through the X's and O's. They'll talk about uh, what the, those plays are called because uh, they get involved with the coaching staff and uh, really break it down. Whereas Myron, again, was a color commentator. So if you ever listen to uh, any Steeler games in the past, it was, and, and Bill just spoke to it, and I know Andrew and, and Albie talked a little bit about it, it was more, you know, the the phrases that he came up with. You know, he, he ran over him like a, 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 a barreling it down like a bulldozer. Uh, it, it was, that was the thing, that was his shtick, and he knew it. Um, so, uh, and I did Buffalo Bills football games. Uh, and, and was not a, a former player. And again, like I said, that in my last year in Buffalo was 1993, and I don't know that there are any, I don't pay enough attention now, I guess, to the NFL to know whether there are any current color commentators or analysts who actually did not play in the NFL, uh, or even college football for that matter. So, uh, and I had a couple of, now Myron was the color announcer for the Steelers when I was doing Buffalo Bills football. And uh, on an NFL Sunday, it, it's, it's not like you're schmoozing with, with the other guys. You're kind of in your world, uh, in, the, in my case, the radio broadcast booth, making my last minute preparation. So on occasion, I would see uh, Jack Fleming, who was uh, then announcing for the, the, the uh, Steelers as the play-by-play -play guy, and Myron. But I actually knew Myron a little bit because I spent 10 years in the Pirates front office in the, in the marketing and, and promotions department. And I will never, ever forget, you know, as his daughter, daughter knows, Elizabeth knows, that he was one of the most honest human beings on the face of the earth, which is another reason I love him. And to the point where, like, and, and Bill also mentioned it, you may not like the answer, so if you ask him a question, you, you, you better have thick skin. And, and, and at the time, uh, I had this incident with him. I call it an incident because it was a big deal to me because I was uh, you know, just out of high school and listening to, to Myron, the Steelers, and, and Myron's talk show, and I ended up getting a, a front office job with the, the Pirates, became a full-time employee, and still relatively young, uh, some, somewhere in my 20s, and I would listen to Myron's talk show religiously. Um, and one night, he talked about the Pirates marketing department, and I was in the marketing department. And he mentioned that it was one winter, as we were approaching spring training, he mentioned that the, the, the Pirates needed to, uh, because they were not, this was uh, probably in the mid-1980s, and they were not playing well, and they were not drawing well at all at, at Three River Stadium. But he mentioned something about how they needed to go back to the past, embrace the past. Uh, and he, he mentioned, you know, maybe get the, get the guys that used to play. Get the, and he talked about some of the players, you know, get, get those on the commercials and so on. And so I had enough influence in the organization that when I went down to spring training, I took it to heart and I talked to the promotion people. I said, let's get some of these uh, players that we have now and kind of talk about the former players. And we would get them in a, in a chair outside the ballpark. And uh, the, the lighting wasn't very good. It, it wasn't by any stretch of the imagination. We didn't use any agency, any, any ad agency. And, and uh, I kind of scripted it out, maybe haphazard. But 
for what it's worth, I kind of thought it was good that we would mix it up with some old time highlights. So if you can envision a current player talking about what he hopes to have happen in the upcoming season, and we want to play like they did back then. And he would mention, I don't know who it might be, a Hannes Wagner way back. And we would intersperse that on, on the commercial with these, these, these highlights of, of the old time players. And I was kind of proud of myself. And uh, when I got back to Pittsburgh, I called TAE and left a message at the radio station. I said, Byron, this is Greg Brown. Um, I hope you've gotten a chance to see our commercials because you know you had talked about it and you know, we're doing it. So if you get a chance, I'd, I'd love to know what you think. And uh, one day the phone rings and I answer the phone before cell phones. And, Hello, uh, Greg, this is Myron. I said, hey, Myron, how you doing? He goes, yeah, you want to know how I feel about it? Yeah, he goes, they're awful. <laughs> and my heart he goes, I mean, they're brutal. And I said, what? And, 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 and he's going, and that's why. And he's explaining it. And, you know, it's a, kind of a life lesson, really, because uh, his idea was not what, his idea was to do it professionally and to take, and he explained it to me. Um, but so, that was, that was my real, true conversation, my phone conversation with Mike. I'm, 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 by no stretch was I a, a great friend. Uh, I was an acquaintance of Myron's. My other favorite story about Myron had nothing to do with broadcasting, but I, I relate this story to the business and, and, and friends of mine. I'm not there yet, but I know people have said, oh, I'm going to turn that off so it matters. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm not there yet, but you know, I've, I've been around, this is going to be my 29th season doing Pirates baseball, so it's, it's, it's been a lot of years. And so there's going to be some point in time, I, I know, where you're going to have to say, you know, it's, it's kind of time to hang them up and move on. But most, I don't know what the percentage is, somebody should do a study on it, but it's got to be in the 90% range. Most of us in this business, in any sport, don't want to leave it. And I guess it's true when, when you're a player. Uh, people hang on too long. In all, I mean, these are great, great jobs. There's nothing like it. You know, there are 30 major league baseball teams. I'm one of, you know, probably 40, 50 major league play-by-play -play guys. So they're, and it's a dream come true. So they're, you just don't want to leave them. And there literally have been people that die in the chair. There's a guy from the Philadelphia Phillies. God love him, Harry Callis, longtime Hall of Fame voice of the Philadelphia Phillies and NFL Films. And he was uh, in his chair in Washington, D.C. at Nationals Park about eight years ago, preparing for a game. And he just slumped over. And his partner said, you know, Harry, you're sleeping. What's he had suffered a heart attack and died. Uh, there are guys that hang on too long, and it's almost sad, again, on the field, at times and, and, and in the booth where you know that they just, they don't have it. Um, and you, sometimes you cringe when you listen to games and you hear these guys, you go, my goodness, yeah, this guy, play by play, color guy, whatever it might be, used to be good, but wow, why did someone tell them? And then the thing about it is I, I think just people hesitate to tell friends or loved ones, it's time to go, you gotta get out of there. It, it, um, and, and maybe if they do tell them, uh, it falls on deaf ears, and the person they're telling doesn't believe it, still believes they're as good as they ever were. But my story is about his, one of his best friends named Joe Gordon. Joe Gordon was the longtime PR man for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And Myron and Joe would frequently have breakfast and lunch together, as, as buddies do, and one Steeler offseason. Myron said uh, many, many years ago, uh, Myron's still in his prime, said uh, to, to Joe, sitting across the table from him at lunch, hey, you know, as a good friend, yeah, you, you, yeah, you got to tell me, Joe, if you ever hear me slipping, uh, you got to tell me when it's time. You're my friend, and you got to tell me. Several years later, they're having lunch again in the same place, and Joe Gordon, God love him, stops breakfast or lunch and says, Myron, eight years ago you told me to tell you as a friend when it's time to hang him up. It's time. 
and it gives me chills to think about it. just what an unbelievable how great that is that story the friendship between these two and the best part about the story is that Myron listened he didn't fight it <laughs> and so Myron retired and, and so there are many reasons why I think and you heard some of them from Bill you heard them from Andrew you heard them from Albie uh, what made Myron so great and so unique and that was one of them you know to, 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 to go when you're still no one if you were listening to a game this last year no one no casual or really hardcore Steeler fan would listen to a game that Myron was doing and go oh boy Myron's really slipping no way so Myron leaves uh, in his prime uh, yeah, as you heard before, he, he, he was unique in a number of ways in that, first of all, he was doing games when there was no satellite radio. Uh, most games were on radio only if you wanted to hear the Steelers before they got really good. Uh, so, and, and it's interesting, too. Uh, many years ago, someone came to me and said, do, do you want, they were getting business cards. And they said, uh, do you want to have Voice of the Pirates put on your business card? And uh, I said, why? Well, so, you know, because you were being the Voice of the Pirates. I said, you know, you know who the Voice of the Pirates is, or any team? It's who the fan says he or she is. It's not because I or you label it. And I said, do you know who the Voice of the Pittsburgh Penguins is? Of course, it's Mike Lang. Do you know who the Voice of the Pittsburgh Steelers is? I said, no, that might have Bill Hillgrove. No, not Bill Hillgrove. It's Myron Cope. And Bill would admit this. Bill is, Bill is now. But Myron Cope was the color analyst for the Pittsburgh Steelers. Most of the years under Jack, as Jack Fleming, was the true voice and play-by-play -play voice of the Pittsburgh Steelers. But Myron was known as the voice of the Steelers just because that's what people saw him as or heard him as. And uh, so but as... As years went on, uh, Myron used his brilliance. He was a brilliant man. He was a brilliant writer before he became an announcer. You know, I know you've heard the story. I wasn't here all morning, so I, but I'm sure it's been touched on that uh, when he, he even was surprised when someone suggested he uh, be an announcer with that voice of his. But then he used that voice, and, and Bill Hillgrove mentioned that he might have been sensitive to people impersonating him but he was well aware of, of that voice and his shtick, and he exaggerated it, he used it. So if you would talk to Myron sitting here, I mean, you could certainly tell it was Myron Cope, but boy, when he got on the radio, he turned it up a notch. I mean, that Pittsburghese and that Cope is of those Copeisms, and that, 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 he, he ramped it up. He, he, was a, he would not sit here with you and have a conversation about, yeah, 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 yeah. He, he did that because he knew people loved it. Um, so those are the, the kind of things that made uh, that made Myron brilliant and, and uh, made Myron who he was. And I'm trying to think if I have any other thoughts that I wanted to write down, but uh, he used it to his advantage. Uh, uh, a couple weeks ago, I, I looked up some things on YouTube knowing about the panel just to catch up on, on, on Myron. There was one... Uh, special that NFL Films did about a five minute piece on Myron. Uh, it's actually was talking about all the different announcers in the NFL and they had little clips of each guy and they talked about how each was uh, germane to his football team and uh, what fans they were and homers uh, how much they loved the team and, and Myron touched on that uh, in this piece. They really concentrated on Myron and how unique he was to, to Pittsburgh and why Pittsburgh loved him so much. And he admitted, and he said, you know, I couldn't see myself announcing for another football team. He said, it, why? I, I, I am a fan of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And so that's what makes it fun. And Byron got it in that regard. He, 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 you know, he knew when to be serious, but he also understood that what it was like to be a fan of the team because he was one. He didn't try and shy away from that. And I think, uh, uh, certainly in my 
business, and me personally, I've heard that over the years from some people that say, you know, maybe you're too much a fan uh, of, of the, in my case, the Pirates, but as Myron said, that's why we do what we do. We're, we're fans of the team first, and we're broadcasters, and that's one of the main reasons why people tuned in to the Steelers, was to hear Myron Cope. I mean, frankly, and I'm not telling secrets out of school here, heck, I was one of them, we had drinking games. We listened to Myron Cope. We, would, we had drinking games every time he did a double yoy. <laughs> and I mean, and, and, and you, you, before the game, you picked it out, whatever it might be. But, but they're playing the, the Bengals. You know, how many times are you going to say Bengals? Whatever it was, you picked that out before the game started, and it was a drinking game. So, but, and so Myron knew that, and, uh, and that's what made it fun. And, um, and, and like I said, I think he, he, he appreciated that. He appreciated Pittsburgh, um, understood his role, and uh, was absolutely, as you've heard here today, one of a kind, and there will be, uh, never be another one like uh, Myron Cook. So that's kind of my, uh, as we're approaching uh, the end of my and, and Bill's segment, but if, I'll, I'll take any questions or comments that, uh, that you might have. Regarding that, or anybody? Anyone have a question? Okay. Yeah, we'll start with Samson, and then we'll go with John. Uh, I was just going to say, who are your current uh, favorite pirate players to cover? My current favorite pirate players? Oh, uh, current? Jeez, uh, a lot of them. Uh, you know, uh, Brian Reynolds. I love the way he plays. I've had many over the years. Uh, loved uh, Al Martin. Became one of my best friends. Uh, I love Jay Bell and how professional he was. Growing up, I loved Willie Stargell, and Dave Parker, Omar Moreno. And, and that's the other thing too, I guess when, when it relates to, to this business and, and, and to Myron, um, and when people ask me about why are you such a fan or a homer, whatever the case might be, and I say to them what, what Myron had said, that. When you spend, in my case, I'm, I'm heading down to Florida in three days. And when you spend, usually in the middle of February when spring training picks up until into October, hopefully someday soon, the end of October for us, for the Pirates, and you get to know these guys on a, on a regular basis, know them, know their families, know the kind of people they are, good people, how can you not root for them? I believe that if you are the home team's announcer and you are not passionate and not rooting for them almost on the air, then you're almost being a phony. Uh, and, and, and that's one of the things my buddy Mike Lang said to me when I first started here. Don't change what you did in Buffalo. Don't change who you are. Because in Pittsburgh, and again, go back to Myron, in Pittsburgh, it's unique. Now, there, it's not the only city like this, but one of the few cities where they'll pick up in a hurry if you're not being yourself. If you're being a fraud, if you're being a phony, they'll pick it up. They don't like that. And uh, so I took that to heart. But yeah, thanks for that. So you're talking about the, how you're a fan of the team that you call the Pirates. With my, I'm, I'm looking at the opposite side of that. As, how do you do that, but at the same time be a realist? Because I feel like in sports media today, the, rela the relationship between athlete and broadcaster, I feel like this is more radio too than play-by-play, -play, but as we see it all the time, players, will make, they're not perfect, and I feel like criticism is part of the industry. How do you do that at the same, but also keeping that love and being a realist? Well, how do you, how do you be critical, but yet still love the team and so yeah. on, basically? Uh, and I'll revert again, I'll keep, this is Myron's day, I'll, I'll keep going back to it, there's another thing he said, and, and, and if you hear his games, as big a fan as he was, the biggest Steeler fan of all, he would be critical. He'd say, uh, the Steelers didn't come to play today, boy, they are, uh, you know, he'd say to a guy who missed a tackle, what's he doing out there, grabbing and grabbing, he's not tackling. And, uh, and so I think that's what you have to do. And I'll admit that over the many years, I have had my hands slapped. I've had by management. I've had players literally call me into the clubhouse. Uh, the baseball, football. I had one time Shane Conlon, a gigantic linebacker for the Buffalo Bills, addressed me after, after a game. I was getting interviews, and he came up and towering over me. He said, why did you say blah, 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 what you said? Um, but as it turns out, if you have a good reason, and I, I explained it to him, 
Um, you're not intentionally trying to bash them. I think they understand. Uh, if not, you do have to be true to your audience. That is critical. I also had a, a, one of my bosses a few years ago say, I don't mind if you're being critical of the pirates. In fact, when they make mistakes, I want you to point them out. Don't gloss over them. Because again, going back to being phony, the fans don't like that either. So tell the truth, but just don't harp on it. And that's, that's a, that was a really good lesson for me. Don't keep going back every inning talking about what happened in the second. Here we are in the eighth inning, and you said it for five times while that guy fumbled that ball or whatever, you know, threw the ball away. And I've noticed over the years there have been some announcers in baseball, and I listened to a lot of the other announcers, uh, who almost became caricatures of themselves. Like they, they got a reputation of being critical, and they thought the fans really liked it. So I would listen to a game, and all it was was ripping his team. And the players, I was like, man, these guys are like in second place five games out in the middle of July, and you would never know it. Um, why? Well, because they got caught up in anything. So, but there's a, there's a fine line there. Uh, but, but I think you do have to tell the truth, but just don't harp on it. That would be my lesson. Anybody else have any questions for Greg? All right. So with you, and, and then we'll get you next. Yeah, so um, you talked about co-visions and the, some of the stuff he did to get um, us fans to like be more involved and love the players. And growing up watching you, I've noticed like you would do that with some of the pirate players, like uh, Aramis Ramirez, like Aramalama Ding Dong, or you know, like other like other players like that. You know, you come up with catchphrases or stuff that like draws us towards uh, that. My question is like, do you have like a game plan going into? going into it, or does that just come on on the spot, or like, do you think of it? Uh, you know, yeah, it's not like I write it down if, if, I, have a, if I have a thought in mind, and, and sometimes, it's, sometimes it's kind of obvious for me. Uh, we had Jack Wilson and Jumpin' Jack Flash was a Rolling Stones song. It's a, to me, it was like, he made a great play one night, and I was like, Jumpin' Jack Flash, that kind of thing. Uh, the, the, a lot of them, yeah, and, and Mike Lang, uh, my one, my mentor, and, and, and I, I've been with, with him out and about over many years, and I've seen it in play, in action. One of my buddies actually came up with one of his catchphrases <laughs> uh, out at a bar one night, and uh, and he used it. And, and so there are fans, friends, acquaintances who will email me, text me, say something to me, write me, and, and say, well, why don't you try this? And that was a uh, a, a young fan I got to know, and, and one day I'm reading my emails. He said, "You know, why not a Ramalama Ding Dong for an Aramis Ramirez home run?" I kind of like that. So sometimes you try it, and eh, it doesn't work. Uh, I had a buddy who, who was, I think, well into a, a late night party at his house because it was in uh, San Diego. When I got back from a ball game, it had to be midnight in San Diego, which means it had to be three in the morning in Pittsburgh. And he calls me. <laughs> My hotel, and he says, I got one for you. I got a home run call. We're all talking about it. Oh, geez. And it was, uh, yeah. clear the deck, cannonball coming, because he knew I'm a big Caddyshack fan. And in that, if you guys know the scene, there's a scene where Bill Murray and Chevy Chase, or Chevy Chase is looking for his golf ball. And uh, there's an incident where he goes, Here, cannonball coming, where he hands him something. And uh, anyway, so and, and it makes sense because it's kind of a, uh, it's, it, it, it's piratey, uh, uh, so clear that that can't all coming. But it, it it varies. It varies, yeah, on on, on how that happens. Anybody else? Any questions for Greg? Um, I had a question on like preparation because I knew Matter Cook was big on preparation. So I believe it was about eight years ago when he was. Um, commentating the 2013 wild card game is uh, number one, can you take us through that night? And number two, can you take us through how you prepared if it was different from any other night? Yeah, uh, yeah thanks for mentioning that because I was going to say that about another reason why it was so good. It, it wasn't just by happenstance. It, you know, he, he make, I think people that are great like that make it look easy, but it's, it's a lot of hard work, and I'm not saying I'm great. Myers great, but but being prepared is something that almost out of fear I do every night. 
Now, football's different. And when I did football, way different, because I had set I had a full-time job at the radio station. I was a sports anchor and talk show host, but I, I did Bill's games every Sunday, but I would use that whole week to prepare. Sometimes there's a fine line between over-preparing, and you get all this stuff caught up, and you're having a one-track mind, and I'm very unorganized, bad combination, bad memory, so I try to put it all together. But I do try every night as best as I can prepare, and because of my bad memory, I write a ton of stuff down. I have a big scorebook, so I write a lot of stuff down. Now, just in case, as Myron told Bill, just in case we get a clunker. Well, in football, back then it was 16 games, now 17. You're not going to get many clunkers. In baseball, it's 162 regular season games and 30 spring training games. You're going to get a ton of clunkers, especially if you're a bad baseball team. So uh, you, you try and be prepared. The best nights are the ones where after the game, and Bob Hawk, one of my partners, always has, not always, but on occasion, will, will point out, because you know, uh, I'm looking at your scorecard. I don't think you used one of these little notes you have here. Not one. That's, that's perfect. That's what you want. You know, you don't want it. Just because you've written it down, that's advice that for uh, would be broadcasters. Just because you write something down and you're prepared does not mean you have to use it. That's just in case a certain lull, a certain time, a pitching change, a rain delay, you know, slow moving pitcher, and, and you got to time it right. You can't just throw some meaningless thing out there that doesn't match. You try and segue it into the moment or get it there. You know, take that moment, take some time to, to get it to the moment where you want it to be. In terms of the wild card game, when the Pirates were in those playoff runs, 13, 14, 15, people thought I was busier than ever. So I had friends and family who would kind of, especially late in the season, the pennant stretch and during those playoff games, almost like not contact me for fear they were gonna disturb me, I was so busy. Anyone tell them this, the true secret is that it was the least busy I'd ever been because the team was so good and so much was happening, I didn't have to. You know, actually, one of the good things about having a, some losing seasons is that it makes you prepared to win. I was ready to win. Um, and uh, that is an advantage of, of, of announcers that, that are on winning teams. You get noticed. And when you're, when you're winning, uh, it's not necessarily... In fact, most times, it's not the announcers that they're tuning into, especially in this day and age. It's the team, the team winning. You don't want to tune in to hear Greg Brown announce the, you want to hear the Pirates, and Greg Brown has to be the announcer, that's fine. Um, and uh, so, and, and in, in terms of, of, of catchphrases, I will say that leading up to that game against Cincinnati, I knew that if the Pirates beat the Reds, they would then move on to the next series, which would be against the St. Louis Cardinals. I didn't write it down, but I thought to myself, boy, I'm going to be on a call here, and the Pirates are going to win a playoff game for the first time since 1992. And here I am, it's 2013. I guess I should you know, appreciate this moment. And uh, I've been walking around and preparing for that day and thinking about it. What would I do if there's the final out? So, well, we're going to be going to St. Louis. And I thought... There was an old, old, like 1950s movie starring uh, Judy Garland, I think it was, uh, who was more famous for uh, being Dorothy in The Wizard of Oz. And uh, in this movie, they have a song. I think the, the, the title of the movie might even be Meet Me in St. Louis Louis. They play it at, uh, they play it on the organ at, at St. Louis's Bush Stadium every seventh inning. Meet me in St. Louis, Louis, meet me at the fair. So I thought, when the final out occurred, I thought, I'd been thinking about it, didn't write it down, but they throw the first base. I thought, Pirates win, raise the Jolly Roger, and meet me in St. Louis, Louis. I thought, you know, it's one of the few times I can look back and say, because most times I look back and go, I didn't like that. That was one of the few times I thought, pretty good. So, thank you for that. Anybody else have anything? Can you describe your feeling in the state when you're in the stadium during the Cueto game? Can you describe how you felt in the crowd? You know, what did you get goosebumps? Well, my goosebumps came, you know, I, I, having been around Pittsburgh a long time, and 
all due respect to the Steelers and the Penguins, I've said it forever. Uh, on the air, off the air, friends, fans, everybody else, I've been on my soapbox forever saying, this is no more a football town than it is a baseball town. It's not a hockey town, I'm sorry. I did no disrespect. I was in Buffalo for five years. When the Bills were winning, it's as crazy as it is here, if not more so. They, they're nuts. But, but it's about winning. It's a winner's town. It's a winner. The Steelers didn't draw diddly when they weren't winning. The Penguins, I was around before Mario Lemieux. I used to go to Penguin games, and there was nobody in those arenas. I used to sit in center ice and with, with empty seats. I was kind of kidding. They say I've got one, uh, one for my beer and one for my heavy coat right at center ice. Uh, and then Lemieux came. They started winning. And then the Steelers, the Immaculate Reception. And, and they won. Now, you take a look at, the, you know, the, again, the, the, it's, it's not a big deal, but there have been, over the last couple of years of Steeler games, about like 5,000 no-shows. The reason is, they you got to win. Um, so, I had always said, what the Pirates did not have when they were at Three River Stadium, they were winners in, in the 70s and the early 90s, but they didn't have a ballpark. They, they played in a football stadium, a sterile, enclosed, football, artificial turf, they need a ballpark. Call their own. And not 55,000 seats, 40,000. So that even when they're 25,000, it looks mostly full, it's intimate. And they got the ballpark, but they didn't have the baseball team. They lost 100 games their first year. And so I kept saying this. I, said, I know what they need to, and sure enough, finally the build up, 11, 12, and 13, and then they're selling out almost every night. And it culminated that night of the Cueto game. And so my goosebumps came before the game, when I decided to go up the top level of the concourse a couple hours before even the gates opened, and I looked down, and I, I didn't take a picture of it, I didn't videotape it, I guess I should have, but my memory will, will be there forever, to look down the corner of General Robinson and Federal Street, right at the home plate entrance, and across the bridge, and to see this huge sea of humanity. You couldn't walk, the, the, there, no, uh, there was all pedestrian traffic, no vehicles, and people all dressed in black because two players, Andrew McCutcheon and A.J. Burnett, had sent it out on social media, let's have a blackout. Fans waving gigantic Skull and Crossbone, Jolly Rogers, chanting, let's go Bucks, just everywhere. It was massive. I thought, this is what I'm talking about. And then when the gates opened, they, like somebody threw honey on an anthill. Boom, people just filing into the ballpark, chanting, let's go Bucks before the, and then when Andrew McCutcheon got introduced, the, the deafening sound, and, and McCutcheon, because he's so popular, you know, Tim Tobacco, the public address announcer, here's batting third, center fielder Andrew McCutcheon. The place went totally, you couldn't hear yourself think, and McCutcheon just it, jogs out to the foul line, and he looks up, this, and he pounds his heart. And he looks, and, and, and I, I had tears in my eyes. It was truly magical. When, when, when Cueto dropped the ball, and then Martin hit the home run, and you just knew it was they were destined uh, for winning. So I think Quato, I argue this with Steve Blass, you know, Quato didn't drop the ball because fans were yelling. And he's probably right. But what I think Quato did do when the fans started chanting Quato, Quato, Quato so loud, I think he picked up that ball and he said, okay, I've got to shut this crowd up. And he figured, I'm just going to throw this fastball right by Russell Martin. He'll foul it off or swing and miss or something, and then we'll quiet it down. And in his haste, he threw a, a pitch that Martin drove out the ballpark. Anybody else? So we know Myron Phillips' legacy with the city of Pittsburgh and the people here. What has his legacy meant um, through play by play? Um, people like yourself. What type of, of legacy yeah. do play-by-play -play guys have in general? Yeah, like what what has he meant to other play-by-play -play guys, you know, uh, not only to see at Pittsburgh, like, you know, like my, what do other play-by-play -play guys think of him in, in general? What do other play-by-play -play guys think of, like, Mike Lang and Myron? Well, what do they, like, look up to him, and, and what do they think of Myron? Uh, I mean, so I guess in general terms, in terms of legacies for play-by-play -play analysis, I, I, 
I try to separate myself because it, it's a it's a weird dynamic for me. I grew up my my story's kind of different. I didn't go to Point Park. No, I did go to Point Park to try to become an announcer, but the thing was real. Uh, I, I was going to Point Park as I was working full time for the Pirates. Uh, so so it, well, I grew up a, a huge fan of Lanny for Terry was the voice of the Pirates and Mike Lang. The, the, uh, the, the the voice of the of the penguins, and so I know what it means. Or certainly meant to me to have these voices with me every night. They were uh, friends without knowing them, uh, and so it, it, regardless of whether the teams were winning and losing, I grew up a Chicago Bears fan. <laughs> For some crazy reason, in Central Pennsylvania, I would tune into WBBM in Chicago on Sunday nights after. Uh, because you couldn't get it during the day, it's too much static, but at night I could tune it in and I could hear uh, Chicago Bear highlights and so uh, I became friends with the voices of Chicago and the voices of Pittsburgh and uh, they were my ties to the city. So I think that maybe is the, the legacy of play-by-play of -play guys um, that, that you have uh, for, for fans of your team that is your historic tie to that team forever. Uh, that'll be ingrained. And it used to be just before television. Again, it was just the voices of the team. It was radio only, and now it's everything. And now the, 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 the legacy is on here forever. And so that's very unusual. When you say something good or bad, when you're announcing a game, it's on there for your lifetime uh, and forever. It can never be erased. And that can be bad, it can be really bad. It can cost you your job. Um, and and you, can, uh, you can listen to it, uh, some good, in my mind, in that call I mentioned, that some bad. I've had plenty of those, and I hear them, somebody will send them to me, or somebody will mention that, I look on a YouTube, and, uh, cringe. But it's, it's always there. So I think the legacy is that, uh, that, that you're, you're always there for the fan, you know, every, in baseball's case, every single night. The win or lose. Mike Lang was there for me even when the Penguins were losing. And I fell in love with the Penguins be really because of Mike Lang. He was there through hell or high water uh, and, and was there to present the game professionally. And uh, I think that's probably the legacy. Let's give a round of applause for Greg Rapp. All right, Greg, I'm going to ask you to stay up there because it is now time for our finale, the impersonation contest. Who will have the best impersonation of Myron Coe? So I would like to ask our uh, two other judges to come up, please. That would be Mr. Kevin Taylor, my boss. He is the Associate Athletic Director and the Sports Information Director for Point Park Athletics. And we also have Keith Palo, who is the Dean of Student Affairs here at Point Park University. All right, guys, so we have to get um, um, a few things set up a little bit. So um, what about Kevin and Dean Palo? Would you guys, do you guys have a favorite memory listening to, listening to Myron growing up? Well, thank you very much. Well, yeah, I'm old enough to uh, live through Myron's heydays, of course, in the 70s and 80s, and uh, watching all the famous Steelers Super Bowl runs and everything. My best memories, and I had the fortune to intern at Channel 4 when Myron was both on radio and television at uh, WTAE. So I'd sneak downstairs when I was an intern, and I ended up staying for a couple of years and just sitting outside of his radio show. And a friend of mine, Lee Rapaski, he ended up being his producer. And so I used to sit there and, and listen to, to him, but more than anything, it was around the Christmas time. And he would do his annual fuck ga 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 kind of uh, Christmas song every year. It was, I couldn't wait for it. And uh, so just in, in the memories of just knowing that I would rather, as Greg will remember, turn the sound down and turn the radio up because the best commentation uh, of any game, Steeler game, was mine. In my best memory, I would have to say, um, you know, someone who uh, was in college when the, when the Steelers beat the Seahawks, uh, you know, it was in 2005. Um, 
that was the, the first Super Bowl of my lifetime. And, um, you know, just to kind of be old enough uh, to remember Myron Coat, and I think um, um, his daughter was saying earlier that, you know, it has to live on. So I, I, I find myself kind of right there, um, still being able to uh, remember Myron and, you know, how great of a uh, absolute all-star team that was with uh, Hillgrove and, and, and Tunch and, and Myron and then Craig Wolfley um, down on the sidelines. And unfortunately, you know, uh, not only uh, had, had Myron passed, but also Tunch. Uh, but now, you know, you see Wolfley up in the booth now, and it's just, uh, you know, you, 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 can kind of, you can kind of see parts of, uh, of Myron and, and even Tunch and Wolfley um, in my opinion, and it's just it's, it's, it's something that's going to live on, and you'll never have a figure like that again. My hope, but th those are some of my best uh, thoughts and memories. I also have to say a cheap ripoff. Uh, Myron had the Copra scope for those of you who remember. So there was a question in the audience about can you be critical? And I remember those segments when he did the Copra scope, and I ripped him off big time in college. And I did a doctor sports thing like he did with the, with the uh, stethoscope around his neck and, and put it under the coperscope to analyze what was happening on the previous week. So he had so many of those uh, things that he just came up with that stuck and resonated with this town. And uh, as I said, it, it's a shame that it, we have to keep remembering and keep reminding the future generations that at one time in this town we had the very best and, and continue to have the very best in this gentleman on my right. So. All right, guys, so, all right, guys, so, to break the ice, we would like to ask you three to give your best note for First Nation. Uh, Evan, you want to go first? I don't know. This wasn't mentioned whenever we had this. <laughs> I completely forgot. <laughs> Maybe we should toss it back to Bernie first. I don't know. No, no, I, no, no, no. I will do later, but. All right, I'll, I'll give you the, uh, you know, everyone knows the, the double yoy. <laughs> How about that? Okay. 
Incomplete. Can't see. <laughs> Donnie Shell, the enforcer. Number 31, Sounds, what a play. Starbuck under center. Now in the shotgun. Back to throw. Steelers bring the blitz. And it's going to be caught down the sideline. And he's going to go all the way for the touchdown. These Steelers looking like Cincy Bungles out here. Looking like the Yonkos. <laughs> and now he scores a huge touchdown. What a bad play. They are terrible. Put in the terrible in town. <laughs> Who else wants to go? Yeah. What is your name, sir? Hey, Paul or Flag. Oh, there you go. There goes Don Shell. Oh my goodness! He's gonna get no, he missed him! He's in the end zone! Oh my god, the terrible town missed him! <laughs> yoy, you double yoy! There goes Roger the Dodger! Oh, he's throwing up to Pearson, or whoever that person is, Tony Hill. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh Tony, you're full of baloney. Joy in double joy. The defense has to use a snoodle for the next play. <laughs> Tony Hill, they're nothing but a hill. Okay, here we go. Now. What are we gonna do? What's the emperor gonna call on this one? Can they block this kick? No? Come on, they can do it! The terrible town, the wind is blowing hard! Oh no, they Yoy and triple yoy on that one, folks. Now what's on the Steelers' noodle for this to get out of this predicament? Seven to seven to half. All right, was there anybody else? Nobody else? I can't do it. I don't know how to think about football. <laughs> oh, John? And there's the kickoff. Out for the return. Mixman, oh, I'm allowed. Back. Mix the move, mix man, mix and he is. Oh, he still cuts it outside, cuts it back. And the cowboy, oh, he's still making a miss. And he's tackled up the 25. Kick it right off here. The Dallas offense, a touchdown in the first quarter of Super Bowl X, broke the Steelers' 90, 1975 streak. And there's Tom Landry talking to Roger the Dodger on the sidelines. <laughs> <laughs> and Terry Bradshaw is looking to take the field yeah. on offense as the Steelers. <clears throat> Here we go, there's the huddle. Cole Quick coming off. Terry, on the center. Takes it. Terry Bradshaw. Takes the snap. Steps back. Looking for a man. He finds him. But he finds him at the marker. <clears throat> He's got a... Uh, That's Randy Grossman. Randy Grossman, yeah. Bradshaw steps back, and he found Randy Grossman near the marker for... He was just short of the marker, or was he... Ooh, I'm not sure. He looked just short of the marker there. call? Anybody else? Or was that it? Alright, I think that was it. Contestants, phenomenal job. <laughs> Panelists, your thoughts on everybody here. Well, my first, uh, yes. first of all, it, it was difficult uh, to, because 
Meyer being a uh, color announcer, the difficult task of being a play-by-play uh, -play guy as Meyer was was uh, was tough for each of the four. That's my my thoughts. So that made it difficult. I thought uh, each brought uh, some copisms to uh, to his call. I thought uh, the gentleman in the back there was was pretty pretty close to, to some Myronisms. And I don't know if it was intentional, but messing up the names that you three guys did, uh, that was good. Because Myron would do that intentionally, Myron said. Now, I just appreciate how everybody got right into character, and you notice that their voices changed immediately. So it had to be, because but everybody digs deep for that, uh, for that Myron, and I do, as Greg said. Uh, making the call was tough. I, I doubt that much was, I'm sure there was a lot of ad lib, but I know that if, if you go back in time and we could hear his call, I can imagine the comments he was making. Can you imagine what uh, you know Landry's saying to Starbuck right now? Can you imagine you know it, what what Noel was saying to Terry? You know, kind of idea. So, uh, but I appreciate it. great effort by everybody. I would say number one that took a lot of guts to do it. You know, so congrats to all of you for uh, getting up there and doing that. That was not easy. And uh, another impression. Uh, that I have took away is that uh, it was great to see three of those uh, were college age, and we had uh, you know those from uh, you know different generations to do that. So um, that was, those were a couple of things uh, that stood out to me. I loved that we heard uh, you know I couldn't quite see you know I, I could hear you know Meyer maybe saying that, uh, but then, and Keith is right that like the voice everyone kind of got right into their voice you know and that you know looking up and then kind of looking back you, know, you, kind of, you could kind of hear Myron in, in the impressions.